Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Uwa. Thanks for joining us on this uh, RCA dissected webinar. Um, quite a lot of us have uh, registered for this event, so that's really, really encouraging. Um, so it's an event hosted by NGP UK in collaboration with ND UK and BWIH. Uh, if you don't know the meaning of those acronyms, so NGP UK is Nigerian GPs UK. Uh, NDUK is Nigerian Doctors uh, in the UK and uh, BWIH is Black Women in Health. I'll probably share their uh, websites later. Um, so we decided to have a webinar uh, on the RCA, which is Recorded Consultation Assessments, uh, the second part of the MRCGP exam. Uh, we just felt being a new exam in the past year or so, it would be good to you know, support our trainees, you know, try and look into this thing. How can we get better um, scores? How can we pass better? How can we prepare for it? So I think it's going to be a really packed webinar today. We have uh, a lineup of really amazing speakers. We have GP trainers, we have GP mentors, we have clinical uh, supervisors, we have um, RCA examiners, uh, we even have a, a training program director who will be speaking to us today. Um, so a little bit of intro about myself. So my name is Uwa, I'm a GP in Manchester. I uh, work in out of hours as well, and I'm a clinical supervisor in the out of hours setting. Um, I'm also quite involved with the um, RCGP, the college, uh, as many of us know, I'm um, one of the national elected council members. Um, I also recently uh, became the vice chair of the Northwest England faculty. Um, so um, that's a little bit about myself. Um, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is currently being recorded. Uh, and this is just so that those who registered and couldn't join, uh, they can listen back to it later. And it's good, you know, it's good to refer back to it. So if you're not too keen on that, you can keep your camera off. Um, let's see. Obviously, as you join, just put yourself on mute so that there's no interruption. Uh, if you can, it would be good to you know keep your cameras on. You know when you can, it's good to you know for speakers to see people when they're speaking to them and get a bit of uh, feedback. Um, we will have a question and answer session after all the speakers have finished. Uh, but if there's any really burning question or comment, you can use the raise hand button and I'll, uh, either myself or um, one of my colleagues will see you. Um, all the way through, please use the chat function, um, questions, comments, you know, anything uh, you want to put on there. Uh, my co-host for today would be uh, Dr. Omon Imohi, who will be giving us a talk later. I mean, I'll introduce her properly later. Um, so just before we kick off um, with the first speaker, I'll just go through quickly what, our, you know, what the day is going to look like. So we're going to have introductions to RCA um, as, as the first presentation. After that, we'll have how to prepare. Uh, and then we'll have how it's scored. You know, it's good to break down the marks, the marking uh, setup. And then we'll, we'll hear about common pitfalls with regards to the RCA. Uh, and then we'll, we'll hear about top tips. And then uh, we'll have a talk on mindset and motivation. And then we'll go into the question and answer session. So just a little bit of, uh, you know, activity or... Um, icebreaker, whatever we want to call it. Can we kindly put in the chat uh, where we're dialing in from, where we're based? Just, just have a quick idea of where we're. So I've already said I'm in Manchester. Uh, so, you know, if you can put in the chat box where you're dialing in from. Excellent, Southampton, Northern Ireland. Excellent. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, Birmingham, Cornwall, great, great, great. That's good. Chesterfield, Kent, Blackburn, Warrington, Bristol, Coventry, Leicester. Great stuff. Kings Lynn. Excellent stuff. Thanks, guys. That's really good. Um, and then next, it'll be good uh, to just let us know what you do. 
Are you a GP? Are you a GP ST1? Are you an aspiring GP trainee? Are you ST2, ST3, ST4? <laughs> um, are you a, a, a trainer? It would be good to just have a rough idea. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Excellent. Got a few ST3s. Got an ST1, ST4. Uh, some people don't know what ST4 is. Um, I think I might be wrong. It's probably if you're doing less than full time or you've taken maternity leave and all that, you know, in a sense, it's like ST4, but in oh, typical terms. Clinical fellowships as well. Oh, yeah. Clinical fellowships, academic uh, trainees. Yeah. Uh, if for some reason your training is not three years. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's correct. Thanks, Jago. Also, you can be ST4 if you're in Scotland. Some of them used to run a four-year program. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Great stuff. I'm loving this. Great stuff. Okay, so let's see. Good. Thanks, guys. Okay, so without uh, taking any more of your time, we will just kick off with the first speaker, uh, introduction to RCA. So I'll just do a quick uh, introduction, or actually before that, uh, if Omo, my co-host, can just say hello to everyone, so we know she's uh, she's on board. Hi everyone, welcome to the RCA webinar. I'm sure that there's so much to learn today. We've got amazing speakers, and it's packed. So you know, just tap into what's relevant for you and um, obviously go back to the videos later if you need to. Welcome everyone, thank you. Great stuff, thanks Amor. Okay, so our first speaker for today is Dr. Chogu Agbaise. She, um, she's an amazing person, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, she's a sessional GP in Kent and quite significantly, she did the RCA, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> she did the RCA, so, you know, she's going to give us first-hand uh, information. I mean, she'll give us an introduction now, and obviously later, she's happy to uh, take questions as well. She's passionate about women's health and medical education, and she's um, quite an active member of NDUK. She's our official, unofficial N NGP UK, NDUK, liaison um, and she's quite passionate about um, uh, an area I'm quite passionate about as well is um, peer support sort of supporting colleagues um, with regards to exams the training and and, and all whatnot so um, over to you now Chogu just uh, unmute okay. yourself and, and carry on thank you thank you well, I'm just going to share my screen okay all right. So as was said, I am Chogu Agbese. I'm a sessional GP in Cairns and I passed the RCA in May. So I'm just going to jump into it. What is the RCA? This is mainly from, this presentation is mainly from the RCGP website and a presentation from an RCGP examiner, Dr. Angela. So this is the definition on the RCGP website. It's an assessment of your ability to integrate and apply clinical, professional, communication and practical skills that are appropriate for general practice. So it may be, you may have other those skills and they may not be appropriate for general practice. So, where's the next slide? So it's pre-recorded videos audio consultations, use it to provide evidence. So in different encounters, sometimes it's out of hours, sometimes it's in the practice. For most people, it will be in the practice. And you're able to also you know, target particular aspects of clinical care and expertise. What's the aim? It's testing your ability as a doctor to gather information, apply learned understanding of disease processes and very, very importantly, person-centered care appropriately in the primary care context. You have to make evidence-based decisions. This one is not usually a problem. And then communicate effectively with patients and colleagues. 
which is where most um, most of us IMGs you know, struggle with. We have good communication. Problem is we need to communicate effectively. And the key element of the RCA is to integrate all these things together effectively. Of course, once you are SD3 and above, you can sit the RCA. You need 13 consultations done in 12 minutes. It can be all audio, all video, all face-to-face -face, or a combination of the three. You submit it to 14 fish um, RCA platform, and it needs to show you demonstrating an appropriate level of challenge as an SD3 to demonstrate safe and independent practice. The examiners are trained, they're experienced GPs, and they are calibrated. Now, this is a very important um, point. Each consultation is viewed independently by one examiner, and they make a global judgment of that consultation. And they are blind to the marks that they give, that you get from other people. They'll give you their own marks and another person will listen and give their own marks as well, okay? Mm -hmm. for, the, for the same case or for different cases. So they would judge your own case per, on that day and they don't hear the other 13 that you submit or the other 12 that you submit. Now you are responsible for getting gaining consent from the, from the patient. You must make sure that your consultations are continuous. Don't edit it in any way. If you are doing a face-to-face -face um, consultation, ensure that it is continuous. Don't turn off the camera at any point. You can just, if you want to do examination, you can turn it to face somewhere else, but it has to be continuously recording. Now, these are, this is an important thing to note. If you're examining or it's a video consultation, you must make sure that these areas are not exposed. If not, your submission becomes disqualified. This is just more information. So swimsuit area, if, you're under, if it's an under two year old child, it's the, it's the area covered by a nappy. If it's a male patient over two years, then it's the area covered by the trunks. If it's a female patient over two years, it's area covered by a bikini. So you need to make sure that all these rules are being adhered to. Mandatory criteria, it's, it's, it, that it's as adjusted from when we, we wrote it in May, from the September 2021 diet, this is the current um, criteria. You have to have a mental health, a child that is age 16 years or younger, and it's not just enough to say it's a child, you have to have the effect of that condition on a child on the child is it affecting their school is it affecting their self esteem you know and over 65 an acute case that's something in one you needed to do something urgently for or a referral like a two week wait maternal and reproductive which can be you know a long a lot of things it can even be you know postnatal depression as well and long term condition one way we approached it then was if you have two of each one, then you will have 12 already and then you just need to add one more. So this is the issue, the case selection. You want to be in the green area. I'm sure there will be more consultation um, discussions about this appropriate challenge. Because if you submit low challenge cases, it will be very difficult for you to demonstrate competencies and capabilities that would show that you can be a safe and independent practitioner. So these are the common themes for overly simple cases. So if you record this kind of cases to be difficult for you to demonstrate things that, because you have to earn the marks. And these are suggestions for suitable cases, you know, new diagnosis, musculoskeletal issues, acute medical issues, menopause, mental health, you know, unreasonable requests, epilepsy review, contraception, okay? This is the marking sheet. What we did then was we printed this and put it on the computer just beside you when you're consulting. If you're reading it every day, you'll begin to know that these are the things that I need to show. These are the things the examiner needs to see to say to, in order to score me properly. So strategy. It's a, long, it's a long journey and it's an adult process. You need to be mentally prepared. You need to find what works for you and stick to it. You need to start getting feedback early, start recording, use a timer, 
once you start, if you start recording early, it reduces your performance anxiety. It re reduces all those um, things that you say, like, okay, I, I, you know, just some, some inappropriate um, conversation fillers. You get comfortable with, get, with being recorded and, and that would really help you. Get a practice partner in your dinner. As an IMG, what really helped me was I had another um, fellow uh, person writing an SD3 writing, but she trained here. And so it was really useful to get, you know, feedback while practicing on how to phrase things because there is a very important cultural aspect to this exam. You need to have someone who trained here or, you know, get interactions with people who have trained here to understand what is expected and how to phrase your questions. It's a very stressful exam. You need to recognize this and be prepared for the long haul. Um, your ears, your practice team, everyone is important. This, you need to have a clear plan on, on, on your strategy to pass this exam. You need to think, do you want to do face-to-face? -face? You want to think about you know, examination. Sometimes MSK is easier if you do a video or face-to-face -face consultation. Concentrate on the um, exam. Don't type during the exam. In the, in the earlier cohorts, there was a lot of complaints that um, people were typing and this was distracting to the examiners. Um, if you change your tutorials to just exam focus, and as I said, you know, listen to feedback, use your peer group, range of people, range of experience. Um, this was a, an, a message I used to send on IQRX to, I got this from Dr. Labari. And this was what I used to send to every patient that I wanted to record. I would explain to them that this is this, this is what I'm doing. And uh, I'll ask for their consent and then explain that the 14 fish is going to call them before to take the consent. That way they don't cut off the call or say no, because it sounds very automated and looks like a, a scam call. So you need to look for ways to make sure that you remove every distraction. So, you know, and maximize your chances. Finally, not every patient is RCA able. You will record many cases. If you find the case is not going well, you know, it's, it's annoying, move on to the next one. You know, if you, if you record a case, you don't, don't think you did well there, the next one will be better because now you've learned from this one, okay? One thing that was really useful for me was uh, this shared decision-making model on, on the e-learning for health platform. It was really, really useful. I spent a whole weekend just watching all the videos. That helped me, you know, judge how, what makes a case complex, how to make a case, case complex, um, read through the patient's notes, have the whole picture, try to paint the picture for the examiner. They can't see what, what you can see. So you have to verbalize it for them to know, to, to give you any score. You have to calibrate the, the case for the examiner. So you are, it's like uh, you're cooking a soup. You need to make sure that all the ingredients are there for it to be, for it to be sweet. I like to cook, so I, I bring up uh, cooking analogies. So you need to have all the elements properly integrated and have a seamless consultation. There's no perfect one, but you have to be shown to be you know, safe. You are presenting yourself for examination. You have to show the examiner that I am capable and I can be let, you know, let go to go and practice independently. 14 fish package is also very good because, um, yeah, because it has all the elements. I, I found it very, very useful because the 14 fish package was, it has, it told, it will tell you, this is how, you know, this is math, this is this, IPS helps for, is this equal to this and this. Um, it's, uh, uh, what they call it, data gathering is this and this. So you know that these are the things you need to show. So once you have those things, then you go into their consultation preparing to show that you know those things and then you come up with a plan that is useful. Please know that you have come this far, you've passed several exams to get here. It will look daunting, but you can do it. Thank you for listening. Great stuff, great stuff. Thank you so much uh, for that, Chogu. Lots of information on there. Um, 
you you didn't leave anything out <laughs> for the other speakers to see. But, but repetition, repetition. But I like it. I like it. This is another thing. We're going to get a lot of overlap from our, our speakers today, but just take a note of what you're hearing, you know, over and over and over again. Um I will I will I will put you on the hotspot a little bit now, Chog. But before I say that, okay, I think yeah so we had a slight issue where the webinar was capping it at 100 participants but i think that has been resolved now so okay. if any of your friends or colleagues are struggling just uh, let them know okay. right so just a quick one uh Chogu, if that's okay now did you did you start preparing for the csa or did you when you got into the right stage in your training did you just was it just rca straight away yeah so i was I was on a career break. Okay. And my mom died. Oh, and then I had to resume. So my mom died in July. The week I was resuming, I was attending Zoom burial oh <laughs> on the, goodness. yeah, that week. So that's what I'm saying. If, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, wow. yeah. So, so from that August, I planned to write in, in, in March. Okay. But I just couldn't make it. And then November, so I, I started recording early okay. because the RC, I, I went, I was on the career break at the height of the pandemic. Okay. And in those six months, I was, I was just doing um, homeschooling. So wow. I came in, yeah. So I came in from six months off to start preparing for RCA, recording cases. Then I didn't start getting feedback early until February. So I knew I couldn't do much. So it was in February that things really, I started recording properly. I was recording all through, you know, from November till February, but none of the cases were good enough because I, I didn't have, I hadn't gotten enough uh, feedback. Mm. So that was what, yeah. So November, December, January, so four months roughly you, you recorded your cases. Yeah, no, okay. more than four months. More than four months, okay. Yeah, but oh, it's from, not for everyone. So for that was my issue. You, yeah, I want to know your for yeah. you. How many months did it take you to record your cases? I started recording from November and I submitted mm. in April. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Because I was pr planning to submit in March. In March, but that didn't work out. Okay. It didn't work out. So from February, I knew that I wasn't. I do not like pressure. So I I just said, okay, I'm not going to do it in March anymore. So I started okay. recording to submit in May. Great stuff thanks for that Chogu. i'm so sorry to hear about your mom um yeah, may her gentle so rest in peace um Amen. we will come back to you thank you so yeah. much thank you All so right, much thank you. cheers right so uh we'll just move on to the next uh speaker uh who's going to be talking to us about how to prepare for the rca uh we have dr obiora obiagu uh, he's a full-time gp based in bristol He's also a GP teacher uh, with the University of Bristol Medical School. He's an out-of-hours clinical supervisor, and he's got interest in geriatric medicine, dermatoscopy, minor surgery, and joint injections. He also wears other caps as well, but we'll just keep it at this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Obi, for joining us. Uh, fire away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so um, Dr. Obi or Obi Aguba, you can call me Dr. Obi for short. So it's good we've uh, had an insight so far on what the RCA is. Personally, I didn't sit the RCA. I had the privilege of doing the CSA. But um, I'll say both are same and uh, both have their strengths and uh, downsides. So for the RCA generally, I'll say um, it's more or less in your own territory, the territory of the trainees. So my discussion about the RCA today is about, you know, mainly from my personal thoughts from the examination, my experience with um, trainees who I currently guide and who I also interact a lot with, and those who've passed other trainers. Hello. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And yeah, so it's more about my experiences and what the RCGP says about it. So going forward, I'll split um, a GP consultation into three. As much as we talk about the RCA and examinations, I always encourage myself, I always encourage trainees, whenever you're preparing for an exam, prepare for real life settings, be a good GP. 
because that's what will take you through, see you through your career, make your patients love you, understand you, and get the job done well. But at the end of the day, we are talking about an examination. So for one to be successful in the RC, I see one split in the examination into three, the consultation process, time frame for preparation, and the type of cases to record and submit. Dr. Chogu has also has already said a lot about um, types of cases to submit, so I may downplay that a bit. So moving on to the consultation process. A good consultation for me as a GP is, you know, like having a good conversation with someone you've just met in a pub or in a bar or in a party or even in a conference. Or for those who dance or dance enthusiasts, you know, it's like dancing with someone, having a good rhythm with someone, nothing mechanical, nothing robotic, nothing, no friction, you know, as smooth as possible. So we want a wonderful consultation, especially for our senior purposes to, to be like a situation where you're having a nice chat with a patient, almost like you're having a nice chat with someone you've known for 1 million years without you losing fact of the reason you are there. And the reason you're there is data gathering. You need to take history. History taking is the backbone of medicine. I do dermatoscopy, whatever skin lesion patients come in with, I still take a good history because half of the information is lying there in the history for the taking. So no matter how smooth your conversation or how relaxed you are, you have to be brilliant with taking a history and try not to make it mechanical. And talking about data gathering, I encourage trainees practice different ways of starting the history. I know some may, for example, have it, oh, I'll introduce myself, ask the patient to introduce him or herself. But you have to ask yourself, what if the patient comes in and says, oh, I'm Dr. Obiora or Obiora, and I'm coming with chest pain. If you've practiced only one strategy, you will be knocked up because you'll be like, um, uh, do I know what do I see? But if you've practiced different ways, maybe you've practiced for that scenario, you'll be like, oh, welcome, Dr. Obia, Obia. Right, I see you've come in with chest pain. Can you tell me more about it? And you see it's going nice and smoothly. It's not mechanical, it's not formulaic. And then you keep working with the patient. And the next step is using the history to develop a shared management plan. Gone are the days when you know doctors and in this case GPs are seen like you know a paternalistic figure. Oh, tell me what, what whatever and I'll do it. Even for older patients, I know the older generation still have that um, I'll say mindset. You know they're there to listen to you, tell them whatever they want. But then, when you are doing maybe a geriatric assessment or working with an elderly patient, you want them to understand what's going on. You want them to give you as much information as possible. You want to carry their carers along or their family. So you will realize that it still goes down to what I've written as number two, using the history to develop a shared management plan with your patient. That will nice and easily glide you into the final stage of every single consultation we do on a daily basis, which is safety netting your patients. So safety netting, you tell the patient in clear details, specific terms, what to do and when to come back to you. For real life purposes and RCA purposes, I think we should forget the trap of saying, oh, if you're not feeling better, come back. That's almost meaningless. And when you read cautionary tales from medical defense organizations, if anyone takes you to cut it, if you're not feeling better, if you get worse, come back. It will turn into rubbish in the cut of law. So you have to be specific. If your temperature gets to 38 and above, or you start bleeding or this or that, you ring your GP or ring the out of our service or go to a &E. So you have to be clear and specific and pick up this nice juicy points left for you to pick up in the RC exam. Because it's an exam, if you don't sell yourself well, just as Dr. Chogu has said, you will lose all these points which are there for the taking. Yeah, we have to keep repeating that. The examiners are independent, but you have to give them that nod to give you those points you need to pass. Right, so I've mentioned a bit about this. All consultations should be dynamic. 
shouldn't be seen as formula in other words you're having a nice conversation with the patient though you're not losing sight of the problem then for one to prepare adequately there is no set time it depends on the contract you have with the rcgp and by the contract it means when is your exit point as an st train so for you to pass your rca and be a good gp at the same time get someone to directly observe you someone honest polite and respectful you don't want the trainer to tell you oh you're such an idiot or or you know top down on you no no matter how bad you are you want your trainer to say right oh dr Obia, will you you know you started this way how about doing it the other way or this way or that way absorb such feedback don't feel bad. I know as doctors, I know at this stage of our career, especially ST3, you've passed the AKT, you're confident, you know stuff, you know a lot of clinical medicine. Then all of a sudden, someone says, mm, how about doing it this way? It hurts us, no matter how much we try to deny it. Doctors, we, we are unconsciously trained to know so much and to have as little mistakes as possible. But none of us is perfect. We're not looking for the perfect consultation. We're looking for the safe and the good consultation that will manage your patients first. You do no harm first, then of course you pass your RCA and pass it well. So that's it. Besides direct observation, gather feedback from different sources, your ES, other GPs, other trainees, even patients themselves. You can even do a mini um. That's something I always encourage trainees to do. You can do a mini MSF without it being the official one. Because if majority of your patients objectively keep flagging something up, that means you're not getting it right. Then you have to work on that thing they are saying. So moving on, time frame, which I've already talked about, it's dynamic, but then it rests on you as the trainee. This is postgraduate studying. Nobody can decide for you when you're ready. But at the same time, any good doctor listens to advice and reflect on it. So the first is, it's within a set time. If you're full-time, you know by May, you should you know, be packing your bags, getting ready to move on in life. If you're part-time, you have to know as well. Then within the set time, it's dynamic. Chogu mentioned she started pre pre preparing four months before submitting. For some people, maybe you've come in with those wonderful communication skills. Remember, the RCA is not really about uh, clinical knowledge. You have to have the clinical knowledge for you to be confident and for you to have a smooth, nice conversation with your patients. But the RCA, you are almost like a, a salesman. And if you don't sell your medicine well, if you don't sell your management plan well with your patients, Compliance will be almost zero. The examiners won't like you and they will fail you. So as much as you're coming in as the person with the clinical knowledge, you have to set that clinical knowledge in a way, simple way for your patient to absorb it, agree with you, and then go home feeling empowered, not scared, and not just empowered, knowing when and how to seek help should things change. So like I say, generally speaking, preparation starts immediately when it's an ST trip. You can't run away from it. It's now up to you with feedback and deep reflection to say, right, these are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. I think I need six months. I think I can actually do this then in three months. On the flip side, we've had trainees who they are training us. I've thought, oh, you're not ready. I don't think you'll ever pass this, blah, blah, blah. But the trainee, deeply convinced, and because they've been working hard, went for the exam, even against advice from their CS or ES, and they passed. And not just passed, they passed very well. So it's a good balance. Don't be overconfident. At the same time, don't talk down on yourself. Rather, recognize your weak points and work on it. And yeah, so like I said, active preparation varies. And I normally encourage trainees to deeply reflect, reflect on it on the task ahead of them before uh, making the decision to sit the RCA. Then on the next slide, we have case selection. Yeah, I don't think I'll overflow this one. Shogu has done a wonderful job explaining this. 
But uh, just as a refresher and the benefit of those who may be joining us now, this is very, very crucial. So it's almost like you having a battle. It's your territory. Draw the points in, seize the points, tell the examiners without showing off, being confident that these are my points. You can't take them away from me. Give this point to me. Well, for you to be able to do that, first, you have to know what you're up against. So the RCGP website is your best friend. No matter what other one tells you, know what you're facing. If, for example, you're planning to get to work and in the first place, you don't even know it's a 30 minute drive, you don't know there are roadworks, you don't know there has been an accident, you'll be late to work every day and everyone will put the blame on you. So same, if you don't know what the RCGP wants, that's failing even before preparing. So please, 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 this website is updated every single time. Know what's going on so you can know how to prepare and get yourself ready. Then, yeah, Shogu has already mentioned the types of cases, the things that will sell you, that will market you, that will convince you. Imagine you go into your GP, you go to your GP, you love your GP because when you say, oh, I've got back pain, they are polite to you, they listen to you, they work with you, and they reassure you. Even when they don't give you that treatment you want, you may phone your GP for an MRI, but if your GP can work with you and give you three or four good reasons why an MRI is not indicated, you live happy, you live empowered, you didn't even get the MRI request, or you leave. So this is what the RCA wants you to do. So example of good cases, menopause, carpal tunnel, which has a physical examination to show your skills, things like nocturnal and neurosis, depression, and what we your educational supervisor, other GPs, and don't ever forget that the non-clinical staff, our receptionists know a lot about our patients. They know the ones they will push towards you gently and say, look, this man is wonderful. He's got proper clinical signs or symptoms. He won't come in there arguing with you unnecessarily. He won't come in and give you any hassle. So layers with the reception team, please don't, do not ever overlook them as a trainee and even as a doctor. In fact, that's part of our competences as doctors, as GPs. We are good with everyone and we try to be good with everyone. We respect them pay attention to their concerns. That way, life for you and your job will be easy. And last but not the least, have more than enough good consultants, have way too many. So when you review, you can be spoiled for choice. At the end of the day, it's solely your responsibility to choose the cases you submit to the RCA. That's not your ES's job. I've had some trainees say, oh, my ES is being unhelpful. No, your ES is just there to look, especially at the onset and say, hmm, Dr. to be a work. You keep saying, okay, or you keep saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, without any you know, reason to say, I'm sorry, doing the consultation. It's a bit mechanical. That's their job. They are not the ones to say, well, this is RCA, all the points in the back kind of case, submit this one. That's not their job. So I, I think I'll leave this here and give room for the uh, uh, next speakers to carry on the conversation we're having about the RCSR. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Obi. That uh, was packed full as well. I hope we're listening. I hope we're taking notes. Um, you know, these are, we have experienced speakers here who are trying to, to help us scale this thing and ace it um so I'll, I'll probably ask you one thing uh obi if that's okay so i'm trying to decide which one i had two questions but i'm trying to decide which one okay let's just let's just role play for instance you talked about um being specific with regards to your follow-up plans and your safety netting now this is so so important it improves the quality of your consultation you know i've heard this time and time again so let's role play a bit let's say i've come to see you with back pain or i've spoken out over the phone no red flags we've put it down to mechanical back pain what sort of you know just give an example of what sort of specific follow-up plans would you give me 
I've had it mm -hmm. for four weeks. I, I pulled my back lifting heavy load and there's yeah. no red flags. So mm -hmm. specific follow-up plans and specific safety netting instructions. Right. So, um, of course, I'm assuming we've had a nice, wonderful consultation. I've checked the red flags. So the conversation goes on. So I just say, Dr. Uwa, right. Following our consultation, I think what you have is just mechanical back pain. It's nothing serious. I don't think it'll cause you any harm. And problems of this nature with management, we've already discussed simple painkillers, exercises I've given you for to manage back pain. This is expected to start getting better within the next six weeks. But having said all this, should you go home and you suddenly lose control of your bowels or your bladder, or this pain becomes excruciating, even without the things I've mentioned, or you're, you're unfortunate and notice your legs becoming weak like a rag doll's. Please, please seek urgent medical care. And that means go to A&E, or if it's difficult, bring us back immediately or contact the out of our GPs to discuss this as soon as you can. So I think you saying it this way, you've not frightened the patient because you say, oh, if this happens, then we don't want to frighten our patients. No. You want to empower them. And to be honest, on the use of time appropriately, when you empower your patients, you're already saving yourself some work. So Dr. Uwa will go home happy. He's still in pain, but he's working as normal. He's not wetting himself. He's not incontinent in any way. Neither is he in retention. So whenever he has that twinge, you'll be like, mm, well, my GP said this and X, Y, Z has not happened. So they will not phone you back. But if you don't safety net well, any twinge, oh, something is wrong, they phone you back immediately. So with appropriate information, the day who as a patient will leave and phone and says, Dr. Obi, my pain has got worse. It used to be three out of 10, now it's seven out of 10 and I cannot pass urine. Or I went to use the toilet, I could not feel my groin on my backside. You as the GP, in quote alarm bells are already set up. You have been empowered. You know what this patient needs. You may not even see him again. Phone call, you ring the, the orthopedic team or the hospital team and say, look, I have a man who's presenting with symptoms of color and Shall we bring him to you? And I don't think any hospital doctor will ever say no to that. And this is without you seeing your patient. You've been able to do this because you've got a wonderful history. You've empowered the patient very well. You've done brilliant safety netting. So that's why when in the news, I know this is now more political. People say, oh, GPs are not seeing people. They are just hiding behind the phones. Yes, you can do a wonderful assessment from the phone if your history taking is on point and if you empower your patient very well. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Obi. Um, empowering the patients, you know, not, not only, but there's a big bit about health promotion and all that, but you're empowering the patient with information, knowledge, uh, with regards to safety netting. So it's, you can see this is what we, this is our day-to-day -day life as GPs, not just for the exam. That's why, they really want you to have it sorted at the exam. Um, that that was really good. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Obi. Um, so welcome. I've seen, yeah, thank you. I've seen a couple of things in the chat. So there's this, the, somebody wants to see the last slide of Obi's presentation. If you just hang fire, I'll bring that back later. Uh, and there's a question about memory loss for a, um, as a good case. We'll come to that later. Just um, don't worry about it. I just want us to keep this flowing. Uh, uh, there's lots of information coming. So I'm just going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, we've got Dr. Ginika Ilichuku, um, and she's going to be speaking to us on how the RCA is marked. Uh, she's a GP partner in Kings, Lynn Norfolk, uh, with special interest in diabetes and sexual health. She's an associate trainer. She's a nationally elected member of the RCGP Council, and she's the treasurer of the NGP UK, uh, and she's a friend of, of mine as well. Over to you, uh, Ginika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owa. Can you see my screen? Yes, indeed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the amazing speakers, Dr. Showa, Dr. Obiora. Awesome. I really learned a lot from you guys. So it's my turn now. How the RCA is marked. So 
Um, I mean, I was privileged as well to do the CSA and not the RCA. And um, yeah, so after you've chosen your cases, you've submitted your cases, you then wait for the results. And um, this is where I come in, how the RCA is marked. Okay. Come on, trying to move to the next slide now. Okay. So we all know that RCA is here to stay now. Well, at least till May 2022, according to the RCGP website. And uh, we know that it consists of 13 cases marked by two examiners, which is good. And you could be scored a clear pass, a pass, a fail, or a clear fail under each domain, which we know as data gathering, interpersonal skills, decision making, or clinical management. And you know, for you to score a clear pass in each domain, you know, for the maximum score you, you can get in um, each domain would be three, which is an excellent score. Um, you can still score a two, a one, zero. A clear fail is someone that is clearly unsafe. And the highest score, like I said before, you can get in one case out of the 13 is nine, if scored by one examiner. And if you multiply that by two, that gives you a total score of 18 because it's been marked by two examiners. So it gives us the possibility of scoring a total of 234 marks, um, but the score, the daily scores or the marking scheme on the day is quite variable. I think they said it's selected by cohort. Uh, we have one of, the, one of our examiners here who will also help us in that. So the aim, I would say, is to score or have a nine at all times. And what there was something Obiora said, he said, when he talked about confidence, you know, he said, these are my points, give them to me. So being that aggressive with your marks, it is certainly possible for someone to score nine. So um, results, when the results come out, you either see a pass or a fail. The feedback is available for everyone. Um, they don't give you a breakdown of marks for each case, but they give you your total marks for each domain now. And they also give you 24 negative feedback statements, which kind of tell you the number of times you didn't do something you should have. Um, a friend of mine, she recently passed the um, RCA and she um, actually gave me her um, result, her, her feedback for, for me to share today. So thanks to her. You can see the pass mark on her day was 144 and usually it ranges between 143 to 144 so far that I've seen. And the total mark to pass on the day was 144. You can see she really passed way above the, the mark. She scored 162 out of 234. So that was, you know, an excellent score. And if you have a look, data gathering, you know, you see they don't give you the breakdown for each case. They just give you your total. So in all the 13 cases you submitted, she had a total score of 56 out of, 40, of out of 78 in data gathering. And we've noticed that we do so well as IMGs in data gathering and where we normally um, is usually the clinical management and interpersonal skills. And you can see that even though she scored quite high in data gathering that her clinical management and interpersonal skills were lower than her data gathering. But, you know, all in all, she, she actually excelled so get aiming for a nine in all will actually be quite great. And, you know, minimum, one of the, the course um, um, organizers will say, even if you've got a six um, in all the cases, that would still, you know, obviously be a pass mark. And this one is just the 24 feedback statements that they give you, just telling you what you didn't achieve in all the cases. It's quite cumbersome, but everything is on the RCGP website. That should be our second Bible. <clears throat> so I just put this here. My slide, my own presentation is quite short. Um, note to self, remember the examiners are looking for the whole package. So be ready with your right questions for data gathering. Just like the two previous um, speakers said, be up to date with your clinical management and have your good interpersonal skills. It's not just the data gathering they are looking at. That is just one third you still need to be up, up to date with your clinical management and your interpersonal skills. You need to have that evidence-based, up-to-date um, management um, advice to give to the patient. 
and they are looking for a doctor who is ready to practice independently without supervision. So give it your best, give it your best. We've come this far, like Dr. Shogo said, and we can definitely do it. If examination is needed, they would love to observe you doing that. And from what Dr. Shogo said, you can actually still carry on doing your physical examination without pausing um, your recording. You can do it behind the, the, the screen or you can actually move the camera, but definitely no pausing, no editing. And do not set yourself up for failure. Someone else will be talking about pitfalls. So certainly do not set yourself up for failure. I think that's the end. Thank you. I've just put the reference to the RCGP handbook on, on the website, just you know, for you to actually read. And there was a slide that Shogo, um, Dr. Shogo um, shared about the the the, um, the marking scheme as well. As she said, she had with her all the time. It will also be advisable to have that, just so you know what everything and what and what is entailed in all the domains: the data gathering, the personal skills and the clinical management. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kinika. Um, uh, Ua, please, I just want to add something to what Kinika has said. This we can't really see your face, so. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so you just, can't see mine either, can you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So just one, one thing. Remember that the examiners are human beings, okay? Even though they, they are calibrated, they're experienced, if you're submitting a case that there's a lot of... Uh, 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 carpenters are working at the background, you are struggling to hear. If they don't hear you, they can't give you a mark. If there's a lot of, you know, a lot of background noise, or you are leaving the examiner wondering, the examiner will be wondering, what is this thing? And then you are not showing. So, like a patient is 20 or 24, and you're trying to start antidepressant. Mention that because you are 24, you're less than 30, we'd like to see you within a week. Mention it so that the examiner knows that you know that if you are less than 30 and you're starting antidepressants, it should be reviewed early. You know, so, so make life easy for the examiner to give you your score. Great stuff. Thanks, Chogu, for that addition. Thank you so much, uh, Ginika, for that presentation and that breakdown um, and the numbers. And like Ginika said and Obi said, the RCGP website is your best friend. You know, there's lots of information there, lots of information. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to just introduce uh, Dr. Aide because Dr. Aide is going to be helping us with the question and answer session today. We're sort of going to do it between um, her, myself, and, and Dr. Omo. Um, and she might have just one question and then we'll move on to the other speaker. Um, so. Dr. Ede is a, is, a, is, a, is a good friend of mine. She's a portfolio GP in Manchester, uh, completed her training uh, in 2015. So she's a mid-career uh, GP. Uh, she's a treasurer of the RCGP Northwest faculty. Uh, she's on the board and she's lead for the mid-career GPs for the RCGP North faculties. She's an RCGP mentor and part of the RCGP Clinical Advisors Network. She's also a clinical supervisor and an OSCE examiner. I, I think she has some trainees who are quite uh, keen on, you know, the, or rather preparing for the RCA and all that stuff. So, um, Aidi, uh, over to you if you're there. Hello, hi, Owa. Thanks for the info <laughs> intro. Um, there's not been many questions in the chat yet, but there's been a lot of thanks uh, to all the speakers. Um, Another question has just come. So the first question, which we said we'll answer later, was whether memory loss uh, is good or not. Uh, I think that was for Dr. Obiora when he presented. So I don't know if you can come on and explain that from your slide. Obi, if you can put up, share your screen and put up your last slide. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so that would we'll do two, two things at once. You're on mute. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let me. Share my screen again. Good. And uh, yeah, last slide. Yeah, last slide. And I think the slide where you spoke about memory loss, that was what the person had a question for. Mm, this one, right? Yeah, someone yeah. wanted to do this last slide, yeah. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Whoever wanted to see the last slide. 
Yeah, that's for the last slide, yes. So I think the question with regards to, is memory loss a good case for the RSCA? That's the, that's the other question. <laughs> yeah, so, well, personally, I'll say it is massive. Yeah, so as much as you want to demonstrate competencies, do not drag yourself in a ditch. How many of us in real life can bring in a brand new, fresh patient who's got memory problems, get a history, get a collateral history and get your MMSC done and then come up with a workable management plan. It's almost impossible to run that consultation. In real life, GP land, we do this in half an hour and sometimes we even overshoot. So it's better you, unless you have someone who's already diagnosed with um, dementia, then they are coming in with, you know, maybe, um, you know, I'm bitter and written, uh, I'm having this family squabble about, they want to put me in a care home. Yeah, and if you're lucky enough and the main caregiver or next of kin is there, then that will help you demonstrate your skills for history taking because you still have to find out at what stage of, say, dementia the patient is on, if they've got capacity, and you have to demonstrate that the patient remains the boss and you're listening to the patient, irrespective of whoever that has the loudest voice in the room is saying, you have to be diplomatic, listen to the patient and say, you know, at the end of the day, maybe the conclusion will be, right, Mr. X, Y, Z, yeah, he still, he still has capacity, he can still live in his home, and what I'm offering you is the OTs to come in, to assess physios to come in, uh, maybe notify social services, package of care and all that. So you're still trying to hand the patient's independence, autonomy, dignity back to the patient. That's the sort of case I think you can manage within 10 or 15 minutes for RCA bar. Diagnosing the, uh, the, uh, dementia, getting everything done, that's a huge, you know, that's a huge task. Thank you. Um, or I'll just mention a few other questions. I know we're uh, so we can keep the time. So I have uh, concise answers so that uh, okay. I can go through this. Really list. quickly, please. Thank yeah, you. Quickly. So someone did ask whether we could submit all telephone consultations or does it have to be a mix uh, with face to face? Um, Oyinye has answered the person to say she would strongly suggest that you should uh, mix the vary your cases. Okay. She's texted, she's put that on the record. Or Thank you can you. submit only telephone, only video, only face to face. But the examiner in our midst has suggested that you, you should uh, mix it. I personally submitted only telephone. Okay. okay. Oh, Thank good. you, Chogun. Thanks, Oni, for that. She's actually our next speaker. Anything else, Aide, before we... We'll just on? take one more before, and then we'll have to do the others later. So someone Thank said, you. at what point will 12 minutes start counting? That's the question from... When you say, how can I help? I also answered that in the, um, in the <laughs> chat. In the chat. Okay, okay. Thank but you. Thank we you. only start once you say, how can I help? How yes. can I help? Yeah. I, I think... Um, if we have the time, it's also beneficial for others who didn't ask the question to hear it, I guess. So it's, yeah. it's okay if we're also echoing it. Thank so you. So I might repeat the question, so don't worry about that. Thank you. Anything over else, Aida? Over... Okay. No, over to Great. you. Great Thank stuff. You. Thank you so much. So, Obi, can you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Uh, while I introduce our next speaker as she shares her screen. So we have Dr. Uh, Onyi Okonkwo, who is gonna to speak to us about common pitfalls of the ROCA. She's a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. She's a GP in Birmingham. She's a GP trainer. Uh, she's an ROCA examiner, and she's one of the elected ROCA examiner representatives. Uh, she's an undergraduate um, community-based medical tutor for University of Birmingham. She's a GP lead EDI staff network for Birmingham and Solihull CCG. Uh, she's an EDI champion for Midlands faculty and she's the co-chair for BAME network, BMA West Midlands. She wears many other hats uh, and uh, she's very highly respected. Over to you, uh, Onyi, thank you for joining us. <laughs> So, oh, I'm not your friend then, because everybody else introduces said this person is my friend. So, well, it's good that hundred and something people can hear you say that. Hi, everyone. Oh, dear. 
Hi, my name is Oni, and I'm like Owa said, I'm a GP in Birmingham and I'm an RC examiner. So today I'm just going to talk to you guys about some of the common pitfalls that we tend to see when we're marking the exam. So before, when we um, heard about the topic, I did put on one of our WhatsApp groups for the examiners to ask them, what would you like me to talk to you, the trainees about? And these are some of their suggestions. Some will be repetition, so please bear with me. Right, the very first one, let me just get rid of this floating panel so you can all see. I'm sure all of us got that email not too long ago about sharing yeah, our videos outside our dinner, and I'm sure a lot of us panicked. Please, if you read that email, you can see all these guidance on the email. It's really, really important. You don't want to fail before you've even started because when you breach data protection laws, you run into trouble even before you come to the exam. So can I suggest that you look at that email again? Can you read the document? What they've suggested, which I, to be honest, I, we all have to obey is that you should only share your recording with GMC approved trainers within your practice and the TPD, that's it. So it almost narrows down who you're sharing your recording with. That does not mean that you can't get help. That does not mean you can't ask questions, but you cannot share patient information or patient um, consultations with people outside your practice. Because at the end of the day, your practice still holds the responsibility for the GDPR. And I'm sure your Caldecott Guardian will be very unhappy with you if they start having to write to the Information um, Governance Office's office. It's not very nice. So please try and obey the rules. Okay, so let's start with case selection. Obviously, before, like somebody said to you, before you go to war, you want to know the rules of the war, isn't it? You want to know where you're going to stand, where you fire and all that. Can I suggest that before you start even doing anything, go to the RCA page on the RCGP website. We update it all the time. There's actually an examiner whose job it is to keep an eye on it. And if there's anything new, we tend to update it. Know the rules. And I will suggest not just read it for the first time. Once a month, just go there and see, is there anything that is new? We promise the trainees that we won't make any major changes without giving at least six months notice. But as days go by and we have different diets, there might be every now and again where we need to tweak one or two things to make sure that the exam remains fair to everyone. Please, can I suggest that at least once a month, just have a look and see, is there anything new? They will always say the dates that it was last reviewed. If you look at it and you've looked at it before it was last reviewed, just have a look and see what is new there. No challenge is the bane of our existence. No challenge cases, before you submit it, think to yourself, is this something your nurse or your HC or your paramedic or your pharmacist can do? If it's something that they can do, please don't submit it because you will not get the marks. What we want to see is that you're safe and you're independent. So if you're submitting uh, something like an ingrowing toenail, a podiatrist can do that. If you're trying to submit like, um, hay fever, I'm sorry, your pharmacist can do that. So think to yourself, does this showcase me as somebody that is safe and independent? If not, please don't do it. Don't do it because you will just lose math. Follow-up cases don't do very well. I'm really sorry to say. Someone's done all the work already. You sorry, are just- Dr. Oni, sorry to stop you. Your slide is stuck on the first page. It's not oh, moved at all yet. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah please. Hold on one second, let's try again. So what can you see? Tell me what you can see. Just your name, yeah, your, the first page of your name and intro, oh, it's gone now. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> can you see something different now? Yes, case selection now, yeah. Okay, fab, let's hope it moves now, fingers okay. crossed. Okay, so don't use follow-up cases because at the end of the day, if you think about follow-up cases, somebody has already done the diagnosis. Someone has already probably started the management. You then reviewing it and carrying on the management. It's not going to showcase you getting the history. So we will not score you anything. If anything, we'll score you zero because you haven't gathered any data. So please think carefully. 
If someone's already done the work, don't use it. Mandatory criteria and breaches, trust me. If you breach, you will lose the whole 26 marks. So you can imagine what that will do to you if you're almost on the borderline. If you miss a mandatory criteria, you they will dock marks for you, you will lose that whole mark. If you miss two, they will take away the whole submission and you won't get your money back. So can I suggest, it's all there in your policy and it's very, very clear. So please make sure that you are following the rules. And that is why it's very important. Don't try and guide the system and think, oh, if I put it as this, it must be this. Don't forget, 260 something of us that are examiners, we are GPs just like you. We've been through the system just like you. If you think you know, between 200 of us, we know more. So we will always find out. Don't try and cheat, just make sure that if you say this criteria matches this, it matches that. And before we put you as a breach, I can't, while I'm marking you, put it down as a breach, no. I would go to um, what we call our marshals because every day we have the examiners marking it. We have the marshals looking after us, making sure that if we have questions, we can go and ask them. And then we have the senior marshal who kind of overarches everybody else. So if before I tick it as a breach, that's why I'm saying we are very, very sure. We, I would go to the marshals and, and I'll say, look, I think this is a breach. And they'll ask me why and I'll tell them. They will go away, they will listen to it. They will discuss it amongst their panel. And once they uphold it, that is a breach, it is a breach. There's no argument. You writing to the college, all kinds of letters will not help. So please make sure you know the rules before you come because you will lose the whole marks. Long-term condition is one that we're seeing a lot of people breaching. You assume that, okay, yes, because the patients had it, and so therefore it's a long-term condition. What they said is a pre-existing medical condition that cannot currently be cured, but can be managed with the use of medication. So read what they are trying to write, because sometimes you see somebody, they'll take, oh, they are talking to somebody and then the person maybe has high blood pressure and they've done it and they say, oh, this is high blood pressure and I'm going to treat it. That's not long-term condition because it's not pre-existing. You making the diagnosis then, it's not, yes, it is a long-term condition eventually that will be managed, but at that point when you're taking that history, it's not a pre-existing condition. Quite a few people tend to lose marks on this long-term condition because there is not that understanding of it. So it should be an established diagnosis already, not something you're diagnosing, not something you're managing. This last one, please, is really, you would think it's, it's not it's simple, but consent is not optional. If the patient at any time, because if you read the law, it says you have to get consent before, you have to get consent after. At any point when they withdraw that consent, you can't submit it because otherwise you've more or less broken the law because you've now used something that they haven't consented to. And that is even worse than you sharing it outside of your practice. Is it moving? Okay, fab. Yes, so, Let's, let's break it down. Data gathering. Remember, when you're doing your data gathering, it's a conversation with your patient. It's not a list of questions. I have to ask you this. I have to, because half the time, you guys go back into your heads and you start asking, oh, is your finger paining? Is your head paining? No, 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 no. It's a conversation. You need to talk with your patient. They talk to you. You talk to them. Please, not for you to just barrage them with question, question, question focused, not a systematic review. So think about why are you asking this question? How would it enhance your ability to diagnose this patient and treat this patient? That everybody says, do you drink? Do you smoke? It's not absolutely necessary for every patient. There are social determinants of health. Trust me, WHO has listed 10 as the top 10, but there are hundreds of them that apply to the patient. So rather than ask meaningless questions that have no, honestly, it, it sometimes it makes me smile because you will just see how random it is in the middle of you're having the next thing you hear, do you drink this? And you're like, 
Where is that from? It's no focus. It tells me you're not having a conversation. Your agenda is different from the patient's. So make sure that when you're asking your question, you want to do something with it. And use the three parts of your history taking judiciously. Remember all three, three marks. If you do one, because what tends to happen sometimes, some of you spend nine minutes, 10 minutes gathering data. If you leave yourself two minutes to do uh, clinical management, there is no way you're going to have a meaningful conversation that will class as shared management. So yes, and you can see what Ginnika was sharing. You do a lot of data gathering, but the maximum you can get is three. If you then lose the whole max for clinical management, that equals zero for both of them. And then you're fighting for three points in interpersonal. So make sure that you are keeping to time with data gathering because that is the one that we see a lot of you spend too much time on. Clinical management. Start with a good explanation of your diagnosis. People just, after, oh, then they jump into management. We need to know, you and your patient need to be on the same page before you start managing them. You can't tell me, I've told you I've had a headache. Then all of a sudden you're telling me, take paracetamol. Take, what is wrong with me? If this cancer that is wrong with me, what will paracetamol do for me? You need to first start with explaining to the patient what is going on. Then you can manage them because then both of you are on the same page and they can understand why you're asking them to have the treatment you're asking. If you don't do that, it, look, there's no way that, that can be a shared management because they have no clue what you're talking about. Remember when I was talking about you um, asking focused questions? When, because when you come to your management, what I'm expecting to hear from you is that you're using part of what you got from your data gathering to manage the patient because that makes the patient focused. So Mr. Bloggs has a headache, okay? And he works in a factory where there is noise. I want to hear that part of that history in the uh, management because you can't just be asking what do you think is going on and I tell you it's cancer and then you come to your management and then you tell me everything else and you don't address that my health belief that means the difference between a patient with headache and Mr. Bloggs that has a headache and thinks it's cancer you need to marry up what you're asking and that's why you need to ask focused questions and incorporate it into the management because that tells me you have had this patient. Examination in practice is not management. What people tend to do is they'll say, oh, I'll bring you into the surgery and examine you. And then they start booking time for the examination. Please, that is not management because if you look at the actual marking scheme, it's clear, data gathering, under data gathering, you have examination. So whatever you're doing with the examination still falls on that data gathering. Even if you're bringing your patient into the practice to examine them, I still want to hear you talk about what management options you're giving to this patient. So if you don't do that, I have no choice but to score you zero in clinical management because you haven't managed the patient at all. Don't fake your exam. That's the new one we are seeing. Because now we say, okay, go behind the scene and behind the screen and examine your patient. Sometimes you type, trust me, I can tell you this one for free. Examiners time it. Some examiners do time it. They will time how many minutes it took you for you to examine that patient and see if it's realistic. Because sometimes you have some really very unrealistic ones. 45 seconds to do a vaginal examination, even if you're simple, I'm sorry, that's not true. It's not gonna happen. So when they time it, let it be real, because if it is not, it's a probity issue. And don't do the one that you and the patient have agreed you do behind the scene. That is you bringing the patient into disrepute as well. Don't do that. Do things for real, because what we want to see, remember, real life, and that includes when you're examining the patient. Someone has talked to you about the swimsuit area. If I see any skin at all within that swimsuit area, you've lost the, mark, the whole max. For that case, that's 26 points. You don't want to be losing 26 points, so be aware of it. Make your 
uh, follow up appropriate is there in that website it needs to be appropriate and realistic you say to a patient i'm going to bring you in to examine you and i'm booking you an appointment in the next one hour by the way if you have a stroke call 999 if you have how is that realistic just think about what you're saying we don't want you to panic your patients think about what you're saying is it appropriate for that time is it realistic to the patient because these are not role players remember that these are patients and your words are powerful if you say you're going to see me in an hour and within that time i'm going to have a, a stroke then ideally you should be calling an ambulance because you're that worried about me that i'm about to have a stroke so think about it easy realistic now coming to um interpersonal skills no patient needs to do anything. So don't tell the patient, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. No, 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 no. Please use motivational interviewing. How? This is a shared discussion. This is shared management. Have a conversation. How will Mr. Bloggs make the change? Not they need to do it. They don't need to do anything. You can discuss and they'll say, by the way, doctor, I'm not, I don't want to do that. And that's the end of it. You need to respect that. You need to ask them their own opinion. What do they think? How can you make these changes? So Mr. Blocks, you drink 17 units of alcohol. Can you think of ways that we can try and bring this down? Now that we've had a conversation and we know that alcohol could be contributing to what is going on. How can we work on it? Let them drive the agenda not you telling them you need to do or you need to do that. Follow their cues, listen to what they are saying. If he says, look, yes, I hear you doctor, but I don't want to cut my alcohol now. Remember what Nice says, brief intervention is your job, not to hit your patient over the head with it or to preach to them. Your job is brief intervention, tell them why it's important, tell them how we to make them better and respect their wishes and please, Talk to your patient. Don't talk to the examiner. You want to tell me you know everything about diabetes. It's not going to score you any mark. If your patient is not in the conversation while you're vomiting everything you've read in nice CKS, please remember, it's not about me. It's about your patient. And then the other thing I was taught to talk to you, just actively listen to your patient. I want to hear you actively listening to them. Follow their agenda. Respect their wishes. I'm so sorry to hear that. It's not empathy, please. You need to really think about, are you really sorry to hear that? Use your pauses well, make it relevant. So someone says, oh, um, I lost my dad. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay, can I ask you, have it, how is that, how does that even show me that you've taken on board what they've said, yeah? Think about it. If you tell somebody, oh, I've lost my dad, how do you expect them to behave? You don't expect them to turn around and say, oh, by the way, how was work today? That's not empathy, that you've said it. Remember, only 7% of what um, your uh, speech is verbal. The rest are non-verbal. You need to be aware of what you're saying and how you're saying them. After everything, honestly, positive mind, positive vibe, positive life. When you fail, you won't be the first doctor to fail an exam. I promise you that all of us have failed at one point or the other, undergraduate, postgraduate, all of it. What we found is that those of you that do well is that positive attitude. Thinking that the college hates you, we are racist, we are this, we are that, doesn't really help it puts you in a bad mindset and you keep repeating the mistakes that you're making without actually taking on board what would help you i would say to you honestly this is high stakes exam each and every one of us as a doctor has failed one exam or the other please remember you can do this at the end of the day you've got this i am absolutely sure of it it always seems impossible until it's done. And that is Nelson Mandela. And that is one thing I absolutely agree with. You can do this. You have the knowledge and the skills to do this. If you can just remember that all the rules, make sure that you're obeying them. And even if it doesn't go well, you can still do it. Thank you. 
Oh my goodness, Anya. <laughs> wow. I, I just have to so say much. thank you so much as well. This was thank a you. serious thing I struggled with. The saying so sorry to hear that my examiner, my exa uh, my trainer said, you are sounding like a robot. So yeah, it was hard. And that was where my mm. problem was to infuse the empathy into my voice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Excellent. Next time we'll do the whole webinar for only you on you, just your talk. <laughs> right. There's a lot to get on board. I mean, we, we have, I think, two more speakers, I think, but um I think Obi's got his hand up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's hear from Obi. Yeah, let me be quick. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. That's fully loaded. So you said a few things that struck a chord with me, and I'll put it my own personal experience to the trainees here, even GPs, because uh, we do, this, do these things unconsciously. So you mentioned about the relevance of lifestyle with the consultation. I got lucky. My wake up call was early or midpoint of um, ST3. So I got this nice gentleman who I'll call a friend of mine. You know, those patients who are quite friendly with him. So Capital Tunnel, good history taking. Then I just threw in the, you know, how much do you drink? And he paused, looked at me and said, Obi, he actually called me by, you know, first time I said, Obi, what, what has that got to do with my, my wrist problems? And I was like, oh, damn, I shouldn't have said that. So it now made sense to me. And by the way, he laughed and answered and said, well, I just rarely drink. He was on as that just a unit in a month or so. So it doesn't make sense. What's, even if he drinks, say one million units a week what, what has it got to do with capital tunnel then another one is um even as a gp sometimes you're so fixated on quaff i saw this lady nice older lady came in for review of depression doing well we'd already got that and i said oh yeah let me check your blood pressure and she was like what has that got to do with my mental health so <laughs> So I now apologize and said, sorry, sorry, that I should have told you that, you know, we, then I explained it quickly and it made sense to her. So it's all about being aware. Yes, in practice, real life, there's nothing wrong in maybe checking BP and all that, but as long as you make it clear to the patient that, oh, while you're here, shall we seize this opportunity to check your weight and this, and it will make sense to the patient. They will know it's not about what they've come in with, rather, it's still about them, but you know, in a different way. Thing. So when you say that, I laughed at myself and I said, "Yeah, maybe I should share this, and it will make sense to to some of us." Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, before we go to the next speaker, I've, I've seen Karim's hand is up, um, so I'll give you the mic to just either make a comment or ask your your question quickly. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, it, it's about ask, it, it's about sharing. Uh, what I, I still didn't get to ca catch who you can share with. So, if you have a colleague, for example, who's a trainer in another practice or in you work in Leicester and they work in Birmingham, and you uh, sit and listen to one of the uh, one or two of your talks with them, or for example, the, the PSW, sometimes they have these coaches. Um, it, it, it's very it's i i read that email my my understanding wasn't that it has to be the um only the people in the practice um i'm can you, would you would you mind expanding on that please okay. thanks Karen. Uh, on you please i think if you go i'm trying to find that particular email so i can share it with you it's absolutely clear in that email yeah it says there at the very bottom of it, it says only, um, what do you call it, GMC, I'll, I'll read it out to you, let me find it. It says only share any recordings with GMC approved trainers within your practice and TPD. And that email went to every single faculty in England. So I think you need to be careful with it and you need to obey the rule. But I will find, you carry on, I'll find the, um, the exact email that we all got and I'll show it to you so you can see what we are on about. Thank you so much uh, for that. Thank okay, you. 
thanks thanks Karim for the question okay so we'll carry on moving on um let's see what we have next so our next speaker um, is Dr. Henry Akintunde. Um, he's going to speak to us on top tips. Um, unfortunately, he is, is, is actually at another conference today. So he's kindly done a recording for us. It's about 10, 12 minutes long. So I'm just going to share my screen and play it. And we'll just um, uh, have a good listen and take notes. Um, he is a fellow of the Royal College of General Practitioners. He's a GP partner. He's also the training program director um, in Northampton, I think. Uh, he's, a, he's a CSA and RCA examiner. Um, so Dr. Akin today believes in adding value to people and helping them multiply their results. He's an author of two books, SMART, S-M-A-R-T, acronym, Tips for Success and Value Shift. So I will bring this up now and share my screen uh, quickly. Bear with me. Can we see my screen yet? Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Henry Akitunde. I'm a GP in the East Midlands and I'm also an LCA examiner. I want to share with you today some top tips uh, to passing the RCA. Sorry, sorry. I think one of the uh, main differences somebody, between the RCA. Somebody's background. Jane, yeah, thank you. Are we good now? I want to share with you today some top tips uh, to passing the RCA. I think one of the main differences between the RCA and the CSA is that the RCA has the advantage for you as a trainee that you can choose the cases that you submit. And so my very first tips are related to you choosing the right type of cases to submit because I think that's one of the best, one of the biggest advantages uh, that you need uh, to take um, in order to be able to pass the RCA and be successful at it. So your case selection, my first tip is for you to start your recording early. Uh, the RCA allows you to submit cases recorded up to six months earlier. And I think you should take the advantage of that to start recording early. So anywhere from three to six months uh, is a good advantage in terms of recording. The benefit of that is that when it comes to submitting, you have a lot more to choose from, and that can give you the opportunity to have refined the quality of your consultations from when you first start recording. Let's face the fact, at first your recordings may not be of the best quality, but as you carry on, you refine that art of recording and you get better recordings with time. So my first tip is start early. Review your cases using the marking scheme. Now, the marking scheme is in a public domain. Go through it, understand it, have a chat with your trader about what the various um criteria in the marking scheme what they mean what they mean in practice what would a good case that meets those criteria in the marking scheme what would they look like make sure you have a good understanding of the marking scheme and use that to mark yourself to judge the quality of your cases it's on the basis of that, that you then do the next thing, which is to categorize your cases. You see, right from when you're recording, divide your cases into three categories, red, amber, green. Red means not good enough. I'm not gonna submit this at all. 
AMBA means might be good enough if I don't get better cases. So you put them in those category. Green means these are good enough. I should be submitting this. The cases that you consider to be green are the ones that you should send to your trainers to review. Nowadays, trainers are getting bogged down by requests to review too many cases. You shouldn't be sending a case to your trainer that you have not self-selected and believe in your heart that this is good enough for me to submit. Now, those sort of cases are the types that your trainer would review. When you send those sort of cases to your trainer, what would happen is that you get feedback on the very best of your recordings and on the strength of those feedback, you know those ones that you can submit and you're ensuring that you're submitting the very best cases uh, for the RCA. The next set of tips I want to give are in relation to um, some data that the RCGP published some years ago when we still had the CSA around about attributes of passing candidates compared to those candidates that are failing. Now, the experience from our point of view as examiners is still about the same, the same attributes we used to see in candidates who did well in the CSA is what we are still seeing in candidates who do well in the RCA. And for candidates who fail, we are still seeing the same attributes. So it's important to go through some of these attributes. In data gathering, the passing candidates are those that can take a focused history that includes all relevant information. Focused is important. You see, a focused history allows it to be fluent, allows it to be relevant for that consultation. Failing candidates, on the other hand, are very formulaic. Sometimes their questioning style can become almost interrogative. You know at the end of the day what you want to achieve, a good consultation should be a conversation and that's your end goal. You want to make it a conversation except that it's guided by a professional. So don't make your questioning style formulaic, don't make it interrogative and by formulaic I mean that already having a script that you have to follow and asking every question on that script whether or not it's relevant to the patient in question or whether or not it's linked to the last statement or the last question that you asked the patient. That leads me nicely to the next point. Passing candidates are those whose questions are embedded in the previous response. You see, this is how you have a conversation. You don't talk to somebody or a friend having a normal gist with them and the next question you have does not build on the last thing that is said. Unfortunately, we see this in consultations. That breaks the fluency and that makes it look formulaic. So use the quest, the answers you've been given to build up the next sort of questioning. If somebody has said something in their last response, that link to the situation, that links to their family life or work. That's an opportunity for you to ask about the home situation or the work situation rather than going to something else. That's not the time to ask about. So, what were you expecting today? Let your questions uh, be embedded in the previous response. Unfortunately, for failing candidates, what we see is a repetitive questioning style showing that they are not listening and the sequence of question does not make sense because they are going off a list rather than having a simple conversation. When it comes to clinical management, you need to be knowledgeable. So you need, you want to make sure your knowledge base is good. So passing candidates appear knowledgeable, they refer to recognize algorithms or modes of practice, even though they don't say it. Um, as an examiner, you know that they are referring to what is standard practice in NICE guidelines or SIGN guidelines. So you want to have that knowledge 
at the tips of your fingers. Unfortunately, your failing candidates, they, the, the knowledge base is insufficient and they, they struggle even in situations. You still have to show ability to think outside of the box. Uh, some things you may not read in the books, but they can sound like pragmatic and practical solutions. The ability to be able to come up with those during the conversation or consultation is one of the things that distinguishes passing candidates from failing candidates. Passing candidates are able to suggest solutions to problems or come up with a range of reasonable management options that are likely to be agreeable to the patient. And that's important, likely to be agreeable to the patient. Uh, two different patients with the same presentation would not be the same consultation because there are bits about each patient that makes that consultation peculiar. So the information and the knowledge you have about your patient must be what guides you to tailor your management options to them. So don't just go through the list of everything in the book. So the fact that in the book, there are several options for treating depression does not mean that's what is applicable for, for this patient. If this patient has already told you that they tried counseling before and they didn't like it, or they don't like talking to people, then suggesting counseling or trying to impose that on them may not be a good idea move away and think of other options. As a matter of fact, say, pick it up from what they've said that you, you've previously mentioned that you don't particularly like counseling. So that sounds like that may not be a good option for you. So for you, I'm going to suggest these other methods. You see, that's somebody that is suggesting solutions that are likely to be agreeable to the patient. Unfortunately, telling candidates they fail to integrate and apply uh, clinical knowledge for that patient, they are afraid to commit to making decisions. In the RCA, you don't get rewards for deferring decision making to another person. I'm going to speak with my colleague. I'm going to speak with my seniors. I'm going to speak with a consultant. You get rewards for actively making decisions. Okay, and that's so important. That's another difference between passing and failing candidates. And finally, under interpersonal skills, passing candidates are able to build a good relationship with the patient, connecting instantly with them, not judgmental in the approach. They are genuinely interested in the patient. If you follow the patient, it's unlikely that you will fail. Even if there may be some gaps in, 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 in your knowledge, if you follow the patient, addressing their concerns, aiming to achieve a, a mutually um, uh, 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 agreeable management plan with them, if you follow the patient, the chances of passing are much higher. But also recognize that good general practice is not always agreeing to everything that the patient wants. You need to be able to negotiate and agree with the patient halfway so that the patient wants a scan, but the scan is unrealistic by the guidelines. You will not um, be doing yourself any favors by just agreeing to the scan. Negotiating why they want the scan and see if you can meet that primary need in another way to be able to come up halfway with them. So think flexibly, pick up on the agenda and come up with workable and pragmatic solutions. Failing candidates do the opposite. They are doctor center, they are inflexible, they are quite rigid, they are unable to explain effectively. So these are some of the top tips I want to share with you. And um, I want to wish you all the best wherever you're sitting your RCA exam. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Henry. Um, you're not here with us, maybe we'll get you in person next time. Um, just, I can see Chogo, your hand is up, but just bear with me one second, I'll, I'll call on you in a minute. So we are running a bit over time. Uh, however, we have one, one uh, more speaker and then we'll have enough time, hopefully for question and answers. Um, 
a few things to mention. Uh, there's been a couple of questions about, is the recording going to be available? Is it being recorded and all that? So it's been recorded and hopefully it will be uploaded to the NGP UK YouTube page within the next 48 hours. So you can watch it back. All the information will be on there. Um, another information is we're going to have a feedback form at the end of this webinar. And hopefully we can email that out to you as well, just to help us have an idea of how today went and what we what went well, what we can improve on for next uh, webinar series. Um, also, uh, this is uh, particularly for trainees. We recently set up a Telegram group for some of us GPs, uh, kind of like mentors and, 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 and trainees. So there's a Telegram group where you can, you know, you can discuss things, you can ask questions, anything about the training, you know, where you're up to exams, anything like that. So um, please kindly contact us, contact me. I'll put information on later so that we can add you to this Telegram group. Uh, also, we have some GPs who have volunteered. They're happy for trainees to contact them for, uh, you know, questions, any form of support. I'll put that on later as well. Um, so Chogo, please, and then uh, on you after that. Thank you. Okay. So it's just many things that he, he was saying were resonating with me. And sometimes it's easier when you give proper examples. So in the beginning, when I was recording, I had my list of questions I want to ask. So a patient is telling you, oh, doctor, my, my mood has been low. In fact, yesterday, I, I, I really had a really bad low. Now, the next thing, th when the person has told you that, the next, that person is telling you that they may have had a suicide attempt. So the next, just go in there and assess for risk of suicide. Don't have your list of questions. Say, okay, the next question I'm supposed to ask is, in the last two weeks, have you been feeling low or, or have you found it difficult to enjoy your regular activities? It, it doesn't, you just be sounding like a robot. It means you are, you are following my, that's a doctor-centered consultation. So wherever the, you know that you have to ask all these questions, if the patient leads you in that direction, sort out that direction and come back. Um, if you want to, another way to ask in a conversational manner is, oh, you, you said, you know, what you were having difficulties at work. Can I ask what you do for, for work? Then, you know, so, so go where the patient is leading you. This thing is difficult too. You have to have done it so many times and then to, to get the flow. But that's the only way for it to become a conversation. You are a, you are a waiter in a restaurant. So you need to be able to guide your patient to the menu of options and tell them which one is the best. Thank you, Chago, for that. Um, Anya, please. Okay, so I think there's a, a lot of um, confusion about this, um, the consent thing. Honestly, we are, I'll put the email in the chat. So it's not me or anyone else saying it. This is what everyone got, okay? And it's absolutely clear who you can share with. But saying that, this is who you can share with freely. If you're going outside that for whatever reason, it's a conversation you need to have. You need to speak to your cardiac guardian. If you don't know who that is in your practice, go and find out. You need to know who it is in your practice that is the information governance officer. They need to be able to approve it. You need to speak to your TPD because I know that a lot of us were very encouraging of the SOX program because that's the best way to on the ground help trainees with their um, consultations and all that. We're very encouraging of it. But you will find that your consent needs to be modified because you need to get consent from the patient to say you are taking it outside the practice. They need to be aware, but it's not something I can tell you how to do. It's something your information governance officer and your dean will be able to tell you how to do to modify the consent for the patient to consent to what you're doing. But for now, that email stands. Those are the people you can share with freely. RCA, um, GMC approved trainers and your TPD in your, in your dean -read. That is it. Thank you so much for clarifying that. 
Um, so the other thing I want to say is, um, like I said, we're going to be running a bit over time. So if you need to head off after the last speaker, you can watch it back later. That's fine. But if you can stay a bit more for the Q&A session, that would be amazing. We have seen loads of comments and questions in the chat. Uh, some of them have been addressed. We'll try and sift through and bring up the ones that haven't been addressed properly during the question and answer session. Um, and during the question and answer session, if it, you have something really burning, you can you know, use the uh, raise hand button as well. So the next uh, speaker, um, she's my friend, like Dr. Onyi is my friend as well. <laughs> uh, so we have Dr. Omo Imohi to, to, to put us in the right uh, frame of mind uh, with regards to GP training, being a GP, passing exams, you know, and things like that. Uh, she's a fellow of the Royal College of General Practitioners. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health. Uh, she has a diploma with the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health. She's a member of the Institutes of Health and Social Care Management. She's a GP in Merseyside, uh, current vice chair of the Mercy Faculty Board. And she's also uh, one of the nationally elected members of the ROCGP Council. She's the founder of Black Women in Health. Uh, she's done a lot of um, um, public health uh, and uh, uh, health promotion awareness, uh, particularly with the COVID vaccine. Uh, many, many more hats she wears, uh, but we'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, uh, Omo, for, for being on, on the webinar. We can't hear Thank you, you everyone, okay. for having me today. And, you know, the speakers have been amazing so far. I wish I had something like this just before my CSA and a group like this that I could um, learn so much from. You've heard so much from the medical point. I've been asked to motivate you. I'm a motivational and transformational speaker. So I'm just going to talk generally, you know, not just for the RSCA, but for our careers as GPs. And, you know, seeing some of us up here doing things, how can you also be part of it? Success is not created. It has always been there. You know, we all just need to align our thinking to it. And in so doing, success will become visible to the world. I learned early in life that success is not achieved, it's displayed. And the reason why I say so is because it's in you already. Everything that you need to succeed, everything you need to pass your RCA is already in you. And it will be available to you if you're willing to think in a way that allows, you know, this success to manifest in your life. So, um, I'm just going to talk about a few things that will, five things really that I think we should focus on with the RCA and with our career as GPs. You are what you believe that you are. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is vision. Vision is so important. Is your vision to become a GP? Is your vision to become a doctor, to make a difference that has brought you this far? And that vision involves you having self-awareness. You must awaken to your true identity. So now we are talking about the RCA. I want you to start to visualize where you want to be in 12 months time, in five years time, in 10 years time. If you don't believe in yourself, you won't have this vision of you sat in your consultation room as a GP. Believe me, you are not here by mistake. Nobody's here by mistake. I personally believe that every single human being has a calling in their lives. There's a void that is specifically there for you to fill, but you need to visualize and see it before you bring it to reality. If you want to succeed in life, you have to be clear about what you're here to do, what you want to achieve, who you want to be in the next five, 10, 15, 15 years. Vision is the genesis of all greatness. So to succeed, you first of all have to build it in your mind because everything we are today, everything you have achieved in your life started in your mind. And to manifest your dream fully, you must have a level of unwavering faith in yourself and in your resolve to pass this exam and to succeed as a GP. So you have to decide what you want in your life, get a vision for it, capture it on paper and bring it to reality. The second thing I would like to talk about is mindset. I like this saying that, you know, what you think, the thoughts you think, the thoughts you internalize become the words you verbalize. Those words you verbalize become the action those actions become habits, those habits become results and the results produce the outcomes that you're looking for. So every successful story starts with a mindset of a winner. I want to encourage everyone today, you might have heard many times, I remember when I was a GP trainee, 
We were told like so many times how IMGs and BAME doctors failed the CSA. In fact, I was told when I wrote my, when I went for my exam, when I came back, even before the result came out, don't worry, even if you fail it this time, you can do it again. This is even before I got my results. So you have to adopt the mindset of a champion. You have to adopt the mindset of a successful person. Adopt that mindset that you will pass your CSA and go in with that mind when you go for your exams. The mind is really powerful and it plays a very, very important role in our journey to success. So to be successful, you need to start to think like a successful person. Don't let anything anyone is telling you to derail you or you know, shift your focus from what's important. You need to protect your mind, isolate yourself from doubters, naysayers, negative thoughts, negative vibes, and believe in your dreams. If you genuinely want to be successful, you have to abandon all thoughts of, of, you know, of failure. You have to down those limiting beliefs and push them aside. And you should not settle for anything less than you've hoped for or you've planned for with regards to your RCA and becoming a GP and doing many other amazing things later in life. A disciplined mind rooted in truth can do the impossible, but you need to pour greatness into your mind daily. And this comes in form of the books you read, people you hang out with, things you listen to, who you follow online. All these things are very, very important. The next thing is excellence. I love to talk about excellence. Don't just go to work, create excellence. Why be average when you can be amazing? Why just be a GP when you can be an amazing GP? So excellence is the standard you hold yourself to day in, day out even when no one else is watching you, going above and beyond for that patient, being extra attentive, being empathetic to that patient, because those things you practice daily become a habit and you just do them without even thinking. And that's why you need to have a spirit, cultivate it, cultivate a spirit of excellence in everything you do. Refuse to be average, refuse, refuse to be an ordinary GP, refuse, to, you know, Try to be that GP that every, every patient wants to see. Every patient feels that when I go to this GP, she listens or he listens. They'll go the extra mile for me. There is nothing wrong with having big dreams, having goals, wanting to make a difference in your practice, in your community. But in order to achieve them, you have to put the work in. And the work in is the extra sacrifices you make, staying a bit extra, seeing that one extra patient, you know, just going above and beyond where you work, doing an audit, things like that. Those little, little things that you don't think count, but they do. Because success is built on a solid foundation and excellence should be the filter through which you see your life. Every day, you need to wake up and ask yourself, what can I do? What do I stand for? Who am I? What difference can I make today? And when you do things, you know, when you do things with a spirit of excellence, you would, you start to see that everything else will work for you because people can, you know, see you, they can see what you're doing, they can vouch for you, even when you think no one is watching you, they are seeing you. So don't let external circumstances dictate your life. Don't let anything you've heard or how you feel about who you are dictate what you do at work and the excellence you give to your patients, because the patients are the core of why we are GPs. So have integrity and have an excellent spirit. Very importantly, the people, the people in your journey matter a lot. The people we surround ourselves with are the biggest influence on our behavior. Like I said, when I started, I wish I had a group like this that I could fall back on, that I could join for you know, um, inspiration or practicing my CSA then. People you hang out with influence the results you get because the people you constantly listen to, the people you constantly hang around, kind of get you thinking a certain way. So if you hang around with the great and successful people, you start to think like that. You are an average of the five people you hang out with. It sounds cliche, but it's true. If you hang out with great people, you will be the fifth great person. So, so the people you hang out with matters a lot. The people you spend time with, and nowadays the people you listen to, follow online, and you know the people you, you actually interact with, your mentors, your, your ES, and people like that around you. They really matter, but I like to talk about OQP, only quality people. I think everyone should make sure that the people you have in your life or the people you associate with are only quality people. Be around people that challenge you, people that inspire you, people that motivate you, people that empower you, and most importantly, people that celebrate you. 
to be great, you have to be around people that understand greatness, people that exemplify it and pursue it constantly. I like to tell my friends, I only like to hang out with the sick and hungry. Those who are sick and tired of being average and those who are hungry enough to do something about it. If you want to pass your RSEA, you have to be hungry. You have to be hungry for success. And there's nothing wrong in it as long as you're doing the right things and doing it the right way. The next thing is focus. They said that the number one reason why people fail is lack of focus. So right now, as you are preparing for your RCA, you have to have tunnel vision, focus on what's important, focus on practicing, practicing, practicing. It's not cliche. They told us this and we did it. Practice, practice, practice. Practice with fellow BAMES, practice with fellow IMGs. Make sure you also practice with, with British born, you know, GP colleagues that can tell you about the culture and tell you if you're wrong, tell you if you're not doing it properly, focus. You can't purchase success with Bitcoin. <laughs> you can't purchase your RCA results with Bitcoin. So, you know, blood, sweat and grind is the key to success. You have to grind to make it work. So you have to decide what you want with your RCA. Do I want to smash this grind and bring it to life, make it a reality? Discipline. Nobody has ever been successful without discipline. To achieve greatness, you must master yourself. You must know who you are. And what you consistently do, like I said before, becomes a habit. So what it starts from here, then here, and then your actions, your habits, your, will bring, bring your results. And those results will deliver the outcome you're looking for. You can't say, oh, I want to pass my RSC and you're practicing once a week. You have to grind. You have to practice every day. You might even be able to practice with yourself. Video yourself on Zoom doing it. Video, we all have smartphones. Use your smartphone, video yourself and pretend like you're talking to a patient. I remember when I was practicing, I used to practice with my husband then who were newlyweds, but I told him, you have to practice with me. You know, I have to be successful. Practice with anyone around you, practice with your colleagues and just discipline yourself to succeed because hard work and discipline are the greatest equalizers. It doesn't matter who you are, where you were born, who your parents were. If you grind, if you're disciplined, if you work hard, you can achieve anything. So you need to ask yourself, how bad do I want to pass my RCA? How bad do I want to succeed? And then go for it. The pride of victory must be paid for by sweat. And finally, perseverance. I think this one, this, this part, I really want to speak to anyone who might have taken the RC already and maybe you've not passed it. This is for you. Nothing can be denied the one who would not be denied. You have come this far. You have done your RCA. It didn't go well. Or you're planning to do it and you're scared that, oh, I might fail it. Don't worry. Have it in your mind that you will pass. Tell yourself that you will pass. But one thing I think that's really important that we all have to have is a strong why. What is your why? Why are you a GP? Why do you want to be a GP? Why do you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to do what you're doing? Because when you have a strong why, you can bear almost anyhow. So you need to know your why because your why is what motivates you. Your why is what wakes you up buzzing in the morning and keeps you up late at night. Your why is the reason when you think of, oh, I just need to rest. Oh gosh, I've tried too much. You will be like, no, I must, I must practice more or I must study for my exams. So your why is important. They say the why is the birthplace of all greatness and she's the mother to all legends. You need to know your why. Your why is what will keep you going when the chips are down. When you feel like giving up, throwing the towel in and just hanging it there, your why will keep you going. You need to persevere. They say perseverance is what made the water break the rock. It's not the strength, it's the persistence. So you need to keep going. I'm talking to you if you've done your RCA already and you didn't pass it. Like Dr. Onyi said, many of us have failed exams many times. Failing is part of the process, but failure is not an option. You only become a failure if you sit there and wallow in self-pity. So you need to get up, stop being a victim, go back to the grind board, go back and look at what you need to do and start to grind. I want to encourage everyone here. We are perfectly designed, strategically assembled for success. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not good enough. Don't let anyone tell you, oh, IMGs always fail you. Don't worry, you have three more times. No, don't let anyone tell you that. You are amazing. You are equipped for this exam. Go and smash the RCA. You've got this. Thank you.
when is your podcast coming out? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Sorry, I'm, I was rushing because it's I'm, 10 minutes. I'm fired up, Amo. I'm fired up. I'm telling you, we need that podcast too. I'm fired up. Oh, thank you so much for that, Amo. Thank you so much. Um, you know. Great stuff. Right. Let's go straight into it. Like I said, we're running over time. There's been lots of questions. Um, between myself, Aide, and Omo, we can sift out the questions. So Aide, do you have a question? And you can pick any of the panelists um, who are available to just answer. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, we're running late. Uh, we'll try and keep the questions, the answers concise when I call you as a panelist so that we can go through as many questions as possible. And if we don't answer your question, the conversation does not end here, it carries on. We're gonna link and we can carry on this conversation after this Zoom meeting. Um, so the first one I'll ask, uh, one that was asked earlier, was that for face-to-face -face recording, do you have to run a co commentary uh, during the examination, or do you wait till you're in, back in the view of the camera to explain? So any panelists can answer that. I'll pick on you. On you. <laughs> That's fine. It's always good to run a commentary because remember the examiner is not seeing what you're doing, so it, it's not as it, it's good. It's good practice when you're because even for the patient, remember, someone is just coming on you and just touching you and not telling you what they are touching you for. And it's, it's a bit discomforting. I remember when I went for um, one of the courses and we we're talking about breast exams and the rest of it. It, may, it relaxes the patient. The patient actually said to us that she found it very helpful one, when the doctor told her what they were doing. So I think it's good practice, even if it's not just for the exam. Try and run a commentary for your patient so that they understand what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, so the next question, uh, I think this will be you because you spoke about this, Dr. Inye. Uh, can you explain again the 26 points loss for breach? Okay, so when when you have your max, not 26 points, sorry. It went, okay, let's talk about it. You get three, 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 yeah? Um, so you get nine from me and then you get um, three, three, three from my daughter examiner. That's 18. What you end up losing is actually 18. So if you don't do well, if you do anything wrong for that particular case, you lose the whole max from the double examiners. It's not 26. The double examiners, you lose all the max we're giving you. I hope that so that's your question. Well, so that, that should be 18, question. isn't it? That would be 18 max lost. 18 max. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Talk more on that. You. Thank yeah. you. So um, sorry. Can I can I, yeah, can I come in here? Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm just gonna wait. So this is for this is actually specifically to you, uh, Dr. Obi. Um, I've also noticed there's a, there's been a few questions around again types of cases, you know, what exactly does long term uh conditions mean i mean we'll, we'll probably come to that and also around the the consultation itself you know how to fit it in you know and all that so so um this person asked if the patient is talking a lot uh and i feel i'm not getting enough time to ask <laughs> how do i proceed you know just a bit of i don't know top tips or, or practicalities i mean we've established not every case would be suitable for rca but yeah. just in case this is going quite well and you know you want to record this one. Do you have any, any advice, any tips? Yes, so sometimes in real life and even preparing for exams, you find a gregarious patient or the patient who wants to be very familiar. But I think we'll start from listening to the patient. My experience, even trained examiners, different trainees, when you give patients a minute or two to talk, most times they exhaust everything. But in the odd situation where the patient is giving you the clinical history and starts talking about, um, oh, I'm going, you know, snorkeling next weekend and this and that. Yeah, politely, because it's still part of your test. You don't want to come across as rude or snap at the patient. Yeah, one line up. Oh, that sounds interesting, Mr. Obiago. But um, we can talk about that on a different day. How about us, you know, carrying on with um, this back pain of yours? Polite, you've literally told the patient to shut up without using that word. 
Um, you've actually in a sly way input shown interest because sometimes we learn from our patients. Patients have told me things about real life, even purchases, where to you know get good deals and all that. But then the focus is the business at hand. In real life, such patients, when I say that after the consultation, if I have time or if I'm that much interested in what they're saying, I'm like, right, yeah, you said something about um, maybe holiday in Greece. Can you tell me the deals available? And some maybe travel agents or stuff like that, and they tell you, yeah, but for exam purposes, yeah, nice, smooth one-liner, show a bit of interest, but take them back to, you know, why they are there with you. Thank you very much, uh, Obi. Thank you. Um, over to you, I, Omar. Do you have any questions there you've sifted out, or should I just carry on? Um, there was a question about um, how do you practice as a single mom, and I think that's a really important one to answer. Uh, Chogo maybe might be able to help. <laughs> so you, you need to um, find. So so my practice partner was, you know, falling. She was, she was pregnant. And she was her husband was not here. So you need to find somebody look keep looking so i i'm i do not you know i'm not someone that would give up so if i try a it doesn't work i keep going i go and try b i go and try c so i kept asking her because i came to a new dinnery so i kept asking please so who wants to practice please so i'll go to their inboxes do you want to practice do you want to practice i kept looking for who to practice with until i found somebody to practice with so you're just going to have to put yourself out there and um, some of us are not extroverts but if you are looking for something as uh, almost say you have to be hungry and you have to take action go and look for the person that you will practice with find somebody there'll be somebody in your dinner there'll be somebody that is looking for who to practice with if you practice with this person today doesn't work find another person look for groups there's even there are many groups around i mean several groups where they do lots of practice from time to time and so many of those groups share several things on, on WhatsApp. I learned so much from different people because everybody has so much information. You see somebody who asks one random question, somebody who just produce one powerful document. I'll put it in my pocket somewhere. You don't know when I will need it. So you have to go and put yourself out there and announce on the group. It there'll be many, it will feel very bad about rejections and everything. But you know, everybody has something going on in their own life that doesn't concern you. So if they can, if nobody responds to you, keep going one by one until you find the person that will practice with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chogo. All right. So there are several questions which someone has kept back again there. And the question was, are all 13 cases examined by the same examiner or is it every, for every case, do you have a different examiner? anyone can answer this. yes for a diff for every one of them you have a different examiner so we are randomly allocated i don't think i've ever listened to one person twice but so in the end you had 26 different examiners listening to your 13 cases okay so another question which is two in one that people have asked and our has um and chuku if you dr yeah. chuku you can answer this one um, this is the question on time management. Any specific tips that can be shared to keep time for to for ten to twelve minutes for this year? I would say that has worked for you, and that you've known with your practice with other um, candidates that has helped. Yeah, this was very difficult for me, especially with mental health. I, in the beginning, I was using thirty minutes for mental health, and then I said, no, I'm going to get myself to ten minutes. So I. Practice. I just two months. I took all the mental health cases in practice. If I saw any mental health cases, it was going on my list. And then I read the nice cares. What are the important things? There are only like seven or eight questions you need to ask the beta gathering in mental health. And then do the suicide risk assessment. And then do the um, do the lifestyle alcohol smoking. You need to practice it several times. Ensure that by six, seven minutes, you can only get three marks for my uh, data gathering. If I ask all the question on the voice, it's only three marks. Six, seven minutes. If you've not finished, if you move to clinical management, from what you're telling me, looks like you know your depression has come back, or it looks like you're suffering, you know, there's some issue with your depression, moderate depression. Then start your management. So you have to learn that keep your keep the timer on. 
six, seven minutes, you're moving to clinical management, whether you are finished or not. If you do that one today, you say, ah, I did not check for suicide risk in this patient. The next time you record mental health, you remember that you didn't ask suicide risk. Ah, oh, I forgot to ask about alcohol, drinking, and cannabis. The next time you, so you, you need to practice it. I recorded, by the time I finished with mental health and became proficient in it, I, my mental health started suffering. And so I had to stop recording mental health for a full month to get myself back. So if you know there's a case where you are struggling, or you know there's you know, one of the mandatory criteria that you are struggling to get things back, practice it until you are proficient in it. There's just no other way. Thank you very much. I think that's very important. I think many of us that practice, or all of us, you need. I had a kitchen timer on my desk throughout my ST. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was just there. If the patient couldn't see it. It was just beside my computer. And once it gets to, I give the golden minute, I move on 2.5, and then I move on out for examination. I made sure I was at 9.2 seconds at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's practice. So what she says, really, so get a timer if you don't have one. Don't use your phone because you look it will look as if you're looking at your phone during the um, mm. consultation. So get a timer. They sell it on Amazon. So then and eBay. Question. Yeah. The next Nine. question for Dr. Vera. Oh, someone is raising no. a hand up. Be careful also with that because if you're constantly looking at your time when you're consulting, it looks almost as if you're not maintaining, you know, you're not respecting your patients. It's like, quick, I need to get on. So please be careful. Do it with style. You know how we do, yeah, with the corner of your eye. Don't just keep, it's not respectful when you move your attention. Very true. Practice. You will get used to what your time is. Once you start talking, talking, you know when ah, I'm supposed to be reaching five, six minutes now. You, you know. Yeah, true. Um, the next question for Dr. Obiora. How do you make it structured if you follow every point, especially when the patient talks too much? You know, some of the speakers did talk about not being structured and like a robot. When the patient says, oh, I lost my mom, you don't say, oh yeah, uh, can we move on? You kind of like want to be in the moment with the patient. So how do you make it structured if the patient keeps talking? And right, so it's about listening to the patient, engaging with them. So, for example, you meet a patient who's coming with clinical presentation weight loss. Then along the conversation, oh, I lost my mom. So it's now left to you to make it relevant to the consultation. So when they say that you use your good pause, I'm sorry to hear about your mom, you give them some time, then you glide in and say, since you lost your mom, how has this affected your life in general. It could be the mom was the main caregiver, the one who did the shopping, who did all the nice cooking, who even set the table for food and called him or her to eat. Now the mom is no more. I'm not bothered about cooking, not necessarily because they are depressed, but being quote too lazy to go shopping, do the cooking. So these are points hidden. So when they say that, they may not be like, oh, I miss my mom there. When she was around, she made sure I ate well. So you see, that weight loss is related to loss of mom. Yes, patient is not depressed because of loss of mom. He or she has you know, come to times that I've lost my mom, but it's having a negative impact. Then back to talking so much. So it's about practice. You have to control your emotions. In mental health, it's you know the same thing you see when a bird, you know catches a worm, goes to the nest, rather than dropping the whole worm for the little chicks, it breaks it down. So when you practice, and of course work with very talkative people, even your friends, you will learn to manage your emotion, not to get annoyed and say, oh, this guy is now talking nonsense. Rather, you politely come in and say, right, uh, Mr. This or that, you mentioned this, can we go back to that again? So even, I'm not an examiner, but Oenye is here, and I believe the examiners won't penalize you for getting the consultation back on track. As long as you do it in a nice, polite way, you're not rude, and you're still very much focused on, say, back pain or depression or whatever the patient came in with. Because same way, 
the patient may not be talkative, but if they go off tangent and start telling you about, oh, that nice movie or that nice dress you're wearing or whatever, the examiner will be mad at you if you start reveling in that, oh, the patient says I wear a nice shirt. Then that's, that's not, you just say thank you and get back to the business. So remember at the beginning, I think every one of us have said, you want your consultation to be a nice, smooth conversation, like you're, with, you're meeting the bulb, but then not losing sight of the fact that you're there for medical business. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vera. Some questions are being answered for some people in the chat box. So keep an eye when you ask the question. I think you've got your hands up. Yeah, can I just come in, uh, obviously, uh, just to introduce him as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've got um, Dr. Ovo Fekodo here. He's the founder of NDUK, uh, outgoing president. Thanks for joining us. And I think you have your hand up. Uh, thanks. We're, we're, we're here to listen to your comments or questions, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Yeah, I think it's been really wonderful. I've been here um, from the beginning. Um, and I, yes, actually I came for my own learning. Um, yeah, cause you know, you have to keep updating yourself about current trends. And I think I've, I've picked a few things here today. I just, I, I mean, just to respond to a couple of things. One is people are saying, if they, you know, that's one of the beauties of RCA. In a case, it didn't go well, patient was talking too much, that's it, just drop it. And that's why the emphasis on starting early is very important. So you don't have to force the case. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, um, because yes, unlike the CSA that everything is um, regulated and calibrated, this is uncalibrated. So yes, a patient, we we'll just keep talking. Some people just talk. It's what they do. They like to listen to themselves. So um, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it. So rest the case, drop it. And uh, about case complexity, I was going to say is, I say that case complexity is a retrospective assessment. You never can tell. You know, you might just start a simple forward hypertension, but then you find out the patient is depressed. And before you know, you're managing a couple of things in one patient, which now provides appropriate complexity. But you might find on that case that's supposed to be complex, but then you know, patient already knows everything. Oh, before you even talk, oh, this, this, and doesn't give you that opportunity to demonstrate. It's all about demonstrating your competencies. So if, if for whatever reason, a case doesn't give you the opportunity to show what you know, then for, you know, then it doesn't, there's no use um, um, submitting that case. And finally, I had to do the exam a couple of times. And my conclusion from it is it's not racist, but it's cultural. It's a cultural exam. So you've got to find a way to understand the culture and demonstrate it. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, so that, that's, what I, that's what I've... Because, um, yeah, sometimes, especially when you feel it the first time, there's all these many talk about, oh, it's racist, uh, you know, IMG struggle. I think our struggle is the cultural aspect of it. So learn the phrases, learn the way they, they are, the mannerisms, you know, and all that. And we practice it well enough, at some point it becomes natural to you and it should be fine. Thank you so much. Um, we are well done, the whole team, Chogu, well done. I think this is really fantastic. And if we can make it as regular as possible to be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah, that, that's the plan. That's the plan. Uh, so we'll see how we get on. Uh, you know, if we can do something before, maybe a couple of months before every diet is, is handed in, that would be great. Um, over to you, Aide. Thank you. A few more questions, depending on how long people want to wait for and our panelists, if you are happy to stay. So I'll just move on to the next one. Um, I think Dr. Chuko, for you. Um, how do you gauge the level of challenge of a consultation or case? Is it to do with just the type of case or the character of the patient, if the patient is anxious or demanding, or the number of presented uh, problems? I think Dr. Ovo just said something about complexity. I don't know if you can answer okay. that. So, so this, was, this is a major problem that people have, and I had this issue as well. So the way I've always told all the people that I talk to, 
go to e-learning for health. There is a, a shared decision-making module there. Once you watch, well, when I watched all those videos, that opened my eyes to say, oh, this is how they want you to say this. This is how they want you to say that. And there's a lot of feedback on that. Okay, so if you have a patient with, um, one of my cases was migraine and the person thought they had migraine, but I looked through the notes, there was no story of the migraine. So you get the story of the migraine, find out how it's affecting their life, find out what factors in their life is making the migraine worse. So I was able to get all that history. And then when it came to management, I brought in, and then I found out how it was affecting their life, how they have to call their mother to come and take care of the baby, you know, look for the things in the, you need to fight, fight be curious. One of the uh, d- discussions is, there's a, um, I'll put it on the group. There's a document, how to help your, can- your trainee prepare for the RCA, it was in the Northern Deanery. And they said, candidate, it does not show curiosity. So if you don't show curiosity in the patient, it means you're not, you're not interested. So this patient is having migraine. How is he affected? Is she going to work with it? When she has the migraine, what about the kids? Okay, is she able to take care of these kids? That's safeguarding that side. Okay, so when she can't take care of the kids, how does she cope? Okay, she has her mother coming. Okay, do the kids live in the same room with her? How is it affecting her work? Okay, all right. Does she have occupational health? Oh, okay. Can you tell occupational health to think about changing your screen? Okay, you're working as an admin person. You're always on the screen. And that's when you, the migraine started. Aha, now we know what caused the migraine. All right, can you come think about changing how your office is so that you are not facing the light? So, and then, okay, there's a medication we can give. So it's not only the medication part. What are the adjustments this person can make to adjust, to make it? So psychosocial aspects can make a case complex and how you are able to manage that psychosocial aspect. If somebody has a mental health issues and you're able to tease out that, oh, the patient has a dog and the patient has cats and the patient has a supportive family. When you're now bringing in the management, I say, those are your dogs. Will you consider walking them daily? Because when you go for walks, that can improve your mood, can improve your exercise, can improve your mood. So you need to find out confounding factors in psychosocial, apart from just, the history of presenting complaint. That is the issue with the, the psychosocial. There is something there. Find out what is underlying. What just as uh, Obi has said, the patient is telling you he wants weight loss, but the weight loss because he's eating bad. And he's eating bad because the mother stopped cooking, the diet, and that was the person that was making him eat healthy. So you have to show the curiosity, but watch that shared decision making. That was what opened my mind. Take a weekend and just and just read the story. And, and my trainer used to tell me because he's a lifestyle, my trainer is a lifestyle coach as well. So he would tell you, if a patient has diabetes, don't just tell them about medication. You need to find out, are they ready to actually change their lifestyle? You need to incorporate the psychosocial and you need to show the active listening. You've talked about, um, uh, you know, you like walking. Or no, 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 you said this headache was a, a tumor. I don't think this is a tumor. I know your friend had a tumor and she started with a headache, but from talking to you, you don't have any, your headaches, you don't have any vomiting in the morning. There's no weakness in your legs, no this. You've now shown that you've done the red flags, you excluded them. This does not sound like a headache of a tumor. A headache of a tumor will come with this. Check on NHS UK, please, and patient.info. There are so many simple ways to explain conditions as well. So this complexity, Psychosocial can complex, make a case complex. Um, a, a, a medical condition can be complex on its own without the psychosocial. But that shared decision making, I have told everybody that I know, go on e-learning for health, watch it. It's, it's done by GPs. Then they, they, will write, they will write small boxes. This is what made a, this case complex. This confounding factor made this case complex. And then if you know all those things and they are not in the records, one of the cases I submitted, the patient had several other issues going on. I made sure I mentioned this so that the examiner knows that this is my case, so it's not just this you. Um, also, I can see the patient has other medical conditions apart from this depression. So you have to look for those things that make a case complex. Watch, watch, watch that learning for health, please. That was my, that was what changed 
it changed my whole you know outlook to the complexity matter thank you thank you that i hope that answers your question dr obiara you've got your hands up do you want to add to it in addition to what you've said, which I completely agree with, currently I'm a GP teacher for, uh, affiliated with the uh, um, Bristol University Medical School. I work with trainees as well in practice. So another good way for GP trainees, even us as GPs to learn, is if your trainer or another GP can observe you, I've, I've, I've made it as a point of learning for GP trainees, med students, even myself to check in with some of our, I'll say, mature patients. So after the consultation, before they leave, I ask the patient, right, Mr. Obiago, what do you have to say about this consultation from your own perspective as a patient? Can you give the student or the trainee feedback or even me as the GP? And they tell you those things they are hidden in their head, both because you pick, I'll call them the mature patients. They tell you how it's made them feel, how you made them feel, and give you honest, positive feedback. So when you triangulate, ask all these questions, it makes you better. It doesn't make you less of a GP. In fact, patients who we've done that literally love us and they want to see you. They phone reception and say, this guy or this med student or this GP trainee makes it all about me. That's why the fact they are the ones bringing in the the medical knowledge. So let's learn to work with everyone. Our patient, as scary as it is, because no GP, no clinician wants a patient to, to give you in quote, bad feedback. And for me, they have, they've been like, oh, doctor, you look stressed today. You look like you were rushing. You, you didn't even give me time to say this. And I'm like, oh dear, I'm so sorry that you felt that way. Can we reschedule the appointment? Or if we've sorted the issue, they leave and I learn to avoid that because that way you avoid complaints as, as well. And that way, even when you go off tangent, that's good public relations. So those patients can now go out in the patient's pool and say, oh, he listens, he makes mistakes, he backtracks, he reflects on it and works towards avoiding, avoiding that. Thank you. Thank you, Obi. Um, do you mind if I say something either, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, you know, and you know, we're shooting over time. We'll probably go for another maybe 10, 15 minutes. So, you know, ask, ask your questions. Uh, we'll try our best. Um, so when I was preparing for the CSA, I kept hearing practice, 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 practice. I was like, don't you have any other advice to give me? You know, 95% of the advice I got was practice, 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 practice. I was like, I'm tired of hearing practice, practice, practice. But in actual sense, that's what it is. Even with the RCA, that's that's what it came to. That's what helped me. I practiced like we've had already today. I practiced with different people. I called different people, listened to my, you know, listen to my consultation. What do you think? You know, I had videos, video surgeries. I played back for my, so it was all about practicing and practicing. So one advice I, I, I tend to give is, you know, for those of us who are not recording yet, just practice. For example, if you're having a consultation, just practice okay, today I'm going to find out about this patient's home situation. I'm going to just find out, you know, just get into conversation so that it's not when it comes to exam, then you have to start ticking boxes. So you'll be like, are you up to anything later today? Um, you know, be like, oh, yes, I'm going to walk my dog. I'm like, oh, you have a dog. Just put it into conversation, you know, like, and then somebody also asked, I'll, I'll come to one or two questions that have been asked. Somebody asked about every case needs to have a nice psychosocial angle not always do you have it now hopefully by now you should have established that if it's not relevant it's not relevant however if you ask the question this migraine you're having is it, is it affecting you in any way is it affecting you at home or at work and if they say oh no 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 it's fine i'm okay it's just when i do this then you shut it down that way the examiner has heard you ask that question they're like oh this gp is thinking 360 do you get me so on the other hand, if the patient says the migraine actually affects my work because I look at the screen. So right now I'm, I'm a bit concerned about, you know, losing my job ahead. Then, you know, there's a little bit there. Ice in a sense is different. You must ask ice. There's, it's non-negotiable. You must. And if all the ice questions are negative, then it's fine. The examiner has heard you. 
It's all about showmanship. But hopefully, you've practiced this in your various groups. You've practiced this in consultation. You've practiced it with your, uh, uh, your trainer. So it doesn't then sound very mechanical when you're doing your recordings. You know, just ask. Um, so, so, you know, you've been, you've been limping since. You know, I, I, I don't know. Has it affected you? Do you have stairs at home? Does, do you struggle with the stairs at home? And I'm like, oh no, I live on a on a on a four four story flat. It's not too bad. I'm okay. On the contrary, you say, oh, actually, my work is like six story and there's no elevators. And then you empathize with them and then try and see, you know, how it's affecting them at home at work. And then you come up with a plan with what you can do with the knee. You know, so these are the things it will come. So so this is one of the reasons we're mentioning uh, uh, the Telegram group. We have. You know, I haven't been personally involved, but we have, I think, one or two groups who are practicing. They are meeting, you know, from time to time. So join the Telegram group. Let's see if we can form groups, you know, as much as we can, uh, you know, at least this day and age. We can all meet up remotely and just do a bit of practice, go through cases and, and things like that. Um, so there's, there's another one here about what if you are dealing with a patient with low blood pressure over the phone and you're asking him to come down to the surgery for face-to-face -face exam. Will you still do safety netting? Uh, again, I also mentioned the whole follow-up thing. I know Dr. Nye gave us a prescriptive, you know, rule to follow. And if you can, follow it. Now, what you need to think about at the end of the day, do you have a structure in that consultation? Hmm. Do you have a structure? Do you have data gathering? Do you have interpersonal skills? Do you have clinical management? Have you managed that scenario? Um, Again, obviously, I didn't do the RCA, but what some trainees have told me is what you can do is explain on your recording what you will do when they come down into the surgery. That way, the examiner is like, oh, this, this, this trainee is thinking. This trainee is thinking. You know, you can say, okay, when you come down, uh, we would have to examine your abdomen and check if it's not hard and not, just make sure there are no masses. Tell me. Your, your tummy, yeah, we'll have to examine this and that. That's what we'll do. And depending on the outcome, we might decide maybe we'll request some bloods or a scan. Or if it's a tummy bug, then we'll manage accordingly. Now, if you're confident doing that, then fine. It sounds all nice and wrapped up. Now, I, 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 I know, uh, Dr. Hon, you mentioned about, you know, um, do you have to safety net? So if you're bringing them down to, so again, we have to avoid being formulaic. Think about it. If a patient has knee pain, you're going to bring them in this evening. Hopefully, the knee is not going to fall off before they come in. Hopefully. <laughs> Do you understand? So, yes, if it's, a bit, if it's worse in any way before I see you, by all means, let us know. I'm not going to say call 999. They, you know, we need to make it sound sensible. If it's chest, if it's chest pain, in, you know, they want to make sure you are safe. You know, if it's chest pain, I mean, in real life, sometimes we can say, okay, it doesn't sound cardiac coming, we'll see you. But we're still safety nets because it could be, it could have a different chest pain in the next six hours. It could have persistent chest pain in the next six hours. You have to safety net accordingly. So we have to be able to be dynamic depending on the cases. Now, lastly, on follow-up cases. Again, do you have a structure? Does it give you an opportunity to demonstrate your competencies, like every, most people have said so far? If it's follow-up of H. pylori, for instance, again, we had some follow-up cases in CSA where you have to then do your data gathering again. But in, real, in reality, you know, yes, you can ask red flags, but it doesn't give you the full flesh of it, to be honest. That's why, you know, we are saying if you can get a fresh case, better. Again, record the follow-up case, get your structure in, get your interpersonal skills, in, get your clinical management, red flags, follow-up, safety nets in. Then play it back, you know, see, does it have everything? If it does, then fine. Sometimes a little bit difficult saying, you know, it must be new hypertension diagnosis, if it's follow-up hypertension diagnosis or cure risk, maybe, maybe not. You know, I think we just have to be a bit sensible, dynamic, flexible, and play these things back and see if it actually um, ticks all the boxes. Thank you.
Thanks, Dr. Hua. <laughs> All right, I hope that answers most of the questions. Um, I don't know if Dr. Obo is around still. Somebody asked the question about what he said. Dr. Question? Um, the question was, he gave a clear example of how the exam is about culture. Yes. Uh, can he give a more clear context about that? So maybe you can answer. What, 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 you know, one good example is um, when you say, um, you know, sometimes people, when they're struggling with their mood, end up, you know, they drink alcohol or they are smoking more. Is that happening? And the patient will tell you, no, I, I don't drink any alcohol at all. I, I don't drink alcohol. You can't stop there. You have to ask, what about smoking? Or you, I've asked the patient before, um, you know, how has your mood been? And how has the, I say, um, it's not really. When they say not really, you need to ask more. So, so the British public is very polite. So you, you need to find out the, you need to go beyond what they're telling you. You don't do direct speech. So you need to go and uh, go, go indirectly and, and look for what you are trying to find out. Um, if, if you want to find out about smoking, you know, in, in a child that has asthma, you know, say, oh, just, just to ask, you know, or you, or you want to ask sexual history, um, you know, preface it and say, I'm really sorry, this is quite a sensitive question, but we need to ask everyone. We ask everyone this. Um, are, are you sexually, I hesitate a bit, are, are, are you sexually active at all? And then they'll tell you, okay, all right then. Uh, so uh, it's just some more personal questions. Have you had any, you know, any, any pain when you're, any pain during intercourse? So it means you respect the patient's privacy. So, so those are the cultural things. You cannot just, there are some ways you, you just cannot do some things somehow. So you have to find how, how they say their things. Look on NHS UK, you see how, how the, the word, the explanations to patients. Once you've, you've, you're able to word it that way, then you don't scare them. So back pain, you know, several people, back pain is quite common. Many people have back pain. Um, and most times it's due to a muscle, you know, the muscle or musculoskeletal. And most times, just as Obi said, if you feel if, if this can get better on its own with exercise and the pain medication. However, remember those questions I was asking you about not being able to wipe or weakness in your legs? Those are things we call red flags. If that was ever to happen, we need to know about it urgently. Or if it's out of hours, you need to call 999 or go to a &E straight away. Is that all right? So you need to learn how to speak. Remember, at the shared decision-making point, you are the waiter, the patient, the, the NHS is the restaurant. You are the waiter, the patient is the customer. So put your head space in the space of the waiter. When you go to a restaurant and you ask the waiter, what are the options? Sometimes the, the waiter will move you into the chef's special for the day. That's what you are doing. What is the chef's special you're trying to present to the patient that you want to for the patient to choose? So you need to, to learn the culture. We, we speak directly, you cannot speak, Madam, you're having uh, diabetes, this is your sugar. You have to stop this sugar that you are eating. No, do you think there's any way, any scope to reduce biscuits that you're eating? Do you think you'll be able to go for more walks? That is not how we will say it, you understand? So you have, those are the changes you have. And you watch, watch how the, the watch how your, um, British trained colleagues are doing it. And then you, you, you know how to, you know, listen, practice with them. You see how they word things. They're saying the same thing that you want to say, but they've changed it. I, can I add to that? I think for me, when I think of the cultural aspect of when I was a tra when I was a trainee and how I had to kind of integrate into the system, especially for trainees that came straight into GP training, is a cultural shock, the lingo, the body language, you know, the, 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 the tone, your tone of when you talk, when you speak, the tone you use, the way you address patients. If you train abroad, most likely, especially if you train in Africa, 
you would have been used to the doctor being the lead and patient just following whatever the doctor says. And that's where one of the major cultural differences comes, where you have to make sure that the most important thing, especially when it comes to management of the patient, history taking, you have to have it joint. Um, making your clinical diagnosis is mostly on you. But once it comes to management of the patient, you have to be very, you know, very, very careful that you're making a joint management plan. So everything has, that's where the real clinical decision and joint shared, shared planning comes in where you tell the patient, okay, for example, you've got diabetes, type two diabetes, you've broken the bad news, you've explained what it is and how can we deal with it? There are things I can do as your doctor to help. There are things I can recommend as your doctor. There are things that you can do to help the situation. There are things we can do together. So I can obviously prescribe medications and refer you to the diabetic clinic, things like that. But you can make some lifestyle changes. What do you think you can change in your diet? Do you smoke? Is, can you stop? Or, you know, things like that. And that's where you have to, is the tone as well, the body language. I, is your body language open? Or are you like this when you're talking to your patient? Are you like this? And the tone you are using as well, there's a tone that's open, you know, there's a way you can speak openly to the patient or where you speak and it's really close, like you don't care, even though you're, you, you think you're asking, like Dr. Only said before, like, oh, you lost your prayer, oh, sorry about that. And then you just move on to the next. So for me, when I think of cultural things, it's things like that that matters a lot when you're asking questions. And again, if you're asking your patient question, when you're doing a history taking, the, Dr. Onye already said this already, sorry to take you back. Um, think of what the patient is saying and develop your next questions from that. Okay, if you're dealing with a patient that is a Muslim, for example, and it's fasting period, and you're talking about their diabetes and you won't start talking about food and all that, they are fasting. So you need to tailor your next set of questions or your management plan to fit with their religious um, mm. presentation at that time. Mm. So it's, just, it's little things like that I think you need to look at when it comes to the cultural aspect of, of dealing with patients. Thank you. The Blue CSA book. The Blue CSA book is really good. If you go through the different, if you read the, the aspect for the, uh, for the doctor part, they have beautiful phrases and words that they've written there, you know, in how to start a consultation. Read the Blue CSA book. Thanks, Dr. Mai. I'll just ask Dr. Oye because she's about to go. So I need to ask her a specific question before I take someone else. Dr. Oye, someone did put this in the chat box earlier. I think it was just, I don't know uh, how the question might come across, but she said, how can we receive guidance from colleagues not exposed to the test? I know many of us that are giving this stuff to the, some of us are examiners, some of us did the CSA. So I don't know how you'd address this question to this um, training. Specifically, how can we receive guidance from colleagues not exposed to the test? Sorry, I'm not even sure I understand the question. So, who are the colleagues that are not exposed to the test? Who are you thinking of? <laughs> that, is, that would be my question. It was because... Philippi that answered that asked this question. I don't know if you want to come on to ask the question specifically, or we'll just answer it. The way we I think the issue is, you know, um, maybe trainers and ESs that that are not used to the, the exams. I, I, I struggled a bit as well because there were some times when I would go on explaining because examination was part of my mandatory criteria. And I'm explaining to the patient the exact thing I'm going to do. And my trainer is saying, why, why are you telling the patient all this? You're bringing the patient to examine. And then I had to explain because it's an, a criteria I need to show that I know the examination I want to do. So there are courses that many um, trainers go for, you know, like the one I was alluding to, how to train, prepare your training for the exam. RCGP has organized several courses. And if you think that your trainer is not um, able to help you, uh, Dr. Nye has something to say. Sorry, Chogu, you were talking. I would have waited for you to finish. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I'm that's sorry. That's that's it. That, uh, uh, that's I wanted it. you to add something to it. Dr. Okay, Oye. so can I yes. just suggest the RCA yeah. Midlands, the um, RCA, um, what do you call it? The Midlands faculty, they run an RCA course. And that particular course is run by Roger Neighbor with 
examiners and um, our chief examiner, Rich Whitnell is part of it, Robin Simpson, Tim Campion, all the people that will examine you, they are all examiners. So on the first day, Roger Neighbor teaches you all you need to know about consultation. And I think that's the blue book Chogu is talking about. He's written a book on consultation. On the second day, you actually get to practice what you've been taught. And then on the third day, you get feedback from examiners about how you did the day before. And I know that a lot of trainees tend to find that very helpful because for us that are not that are not trained in England, sometimes like we're talking about, we don't know all those softer skills of how to do consultations and how to put things together. Even on that day too, Nick and John, uh, Nick Bolek and John Mallow will tell you how to choose your cases, how to target your recording, they'll give you a crib sheet on how to make sure you meet all the criteria. So if you're asking me how you can get help, for me, I would say to you, that is one of the courses that if you can go to, and I know it's within your 500 pounds educational budget. If it's something that you can go to, I know they have a waiting list all the time. Please do attend it because you will learn an absolute lot. And hopefully you will have examiners there to answer your questions. And like I said, your, the chief examiner will be there in case you have any odd questions you want to ask. Thank you. Are you doing uh, anything uh, before I... Do you have anything pressing? Because I think we need no, to be wrapping this up to, now. I was just going to say, we're going to okay, round okay. it off uh, okay. because um, we can we have so many questions that will keep going. So yes. this conversation is going to yes. carry on. Many people want to join the group, so the information has been kept there to join the Telegram. Yes. Yes. And you can ask more questions as you link up with other people that are involved. Uh, before you round up, oh, I think Dr. Obira has had his hand up. Yes, after Dr. Obira. Dr. Oye for that. Yeah, Dr. Oye, don't leave yet, please. Just one second. <laughs> so, Obira, you have to be quick. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I've seen a lot of questions on ice. When to do ice, how to do ice. Do you do it first or do you do this? So, ice is dynamic. I'll give an example of a patient who came in uh, after the greetings. Oh, I would like to have an MRI. So if you've never practiced, you'll be caught on oh, what do I do next? So he's already told you his expectations, even before telling you anything else. So a polite way, and this is real life, oh, yes, we can do that if there is clinical indication for it. But can you tell me more of why you want to have an MRI? Then he goes back to, I've got back pain. Then you explain, and during the conversation, the consultation, he mentioned his dad had prostate cancer, started with back pain, detected by MRI. So that's how you pick the consent. You can see it sort of scattered all around. So you can't wait and say, because if you freeze and say, oh, what do I do now? Then that's you stuttering from the onset. So I expect eyes in all parts of the conversation. Eyes will not wait for you waiting to pick it up. Eyes, oh, here you go. This is eyes. Have me know. It can be at the beginning, it can be at the middle, it can be at the end of your data gathering. So we have to remember to be dynamic, flow with the patient, flow with the conversation, and you'll have a wonderful consultation with your patients. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so this is a very, like, one second question for you, uh, Oni. So somebody just asked, can you record two different cases with one patient? For example, patient wants to discuss her mental health and also knee arthritis. Can they all fit within 12 minutes will be the question I'll have to ask you back. Yeah. Can you justifiably do both of them in 12 minutes and do it well? No. If you can, it's up to you. <laughs> but I would suggest, I don't think you could. I thought as much. Thank you so much for that. So uh, thanks. Maybe they're asking if you can record the patient to now for knee pain, and then tomorrow you now record them for mental health. Somebody has asked this question in the RCA community on 14 fish. I think that's what they're asking, Dr. Tony. Exactly. Thank you very much for clarifying this. That's what exactly I'm asking. I'm really sorry if that was not a clear question. I'm really sorry for that. Thanks for the question. Well, that's a difficult one. But if there are two different consultations and two different, I would imagine possibly, 
but they are quite clear you can use one case for too many things. But I would say, why would you, you have between now and March or February, why would you keep using one person? Is there a reason why you cannot use another patient? Would be my question to you. Well, I just put it in that way. The mum has put two online consultations for discussing two children. One, she is worried about headache. And once she is worried about common cold or she's thinking that the other child needs antibiotic. So these are the two consultations, different consultations for two different child. And if you want to record those two consultations with one, with one mom uh, concerning about two children, should that be okay? Can you see you've answered your own question? Two children, it's not one child. Indeed. Although they have the same parents, there are two Indeed. children. So there are two Indeed. patients. It's not one patient, yeah? Indeed. Indeed. So you can see there are two completely different consultations. I'm not saying it cannot happen. You might have Mr. Blocks come and see you today for high blood pressure and you talk to him about it and it's a fantastic conversation. And then maybe tomorrow he comes to talk to you about his prostate. You can talk to him about it. That's a different consultation altogether. The important thing is that they are completely different consultations. Indeed. And likewise, this mother, yes, is one mother, but there are two children. So why True. not? There are two patients. True. But basically, you're talking about the one patient that why you want to consult two patients for the two different reasons. Is that is what you said? Sorry, I no, didn't talk. No, that. what she's saying is that you have three or four months to prepare. Why do you need to consult one patient twice for different things when there are so many patients that should come through your surgery, you know, over the course of three to four months? So it's just, it, it looks like you're limiting yourself, but there's a lot of capacity to record these 13 cases from 13 different people in the space of uh, 180 days from the date of submission. I'm with you. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'm with you. Yeah. Thank you very All much right. for clarifying this. I appreciate yeah. you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for all the, we've seen lots of wonderful comments about the webinar. Um, so this, uh, we're, we're so happy to hear that. And sorry, uh, I apologize again. We've gone 45 <laughs> minutes over time. Uh, you know, fingers crossed, either next time we would say, we would give, you know, give more time or we'll try and keep the time. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been involved with this webinar, who's organized it. Thank you for all the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Chogo, Dr. Obio, Dr. Ginika, Dr. Onyi, Dr. Henry, Dr. Omon, Dr. Ayede, um, and everyone else who's, you know, I haven't mentioned their names. Um, so like I said, the recording will be available in another maybe 24, 48 hours on our YouTube page. Uh, connect with, connect with us. Um, future events, you know, we're hoping, we haven't given a date yet, we'll maybe give about two months or so before the next RCA diet is due. Um, we are on Instagram, we are on Twitter, and we are on Facebook as well. So please reach out uh, uh, and just, you know, you know, keep updated with our future events. Uh, sorry, go on, Omar. And just to add, sorry, because you were going to mention this, um, our future events, we are hoping to have smaller groups where we can actually do like real practice with each other or watch you practice with each other with an examiner or um, a mentor or supervisor there in that group as well. So we'll, the, it will be announced um, once the dates are fixed so that people can actually have hands-on practice as well. Thank you so much. Uh, anything from any of the speakers to, to wrap up anything you want to say or while we finish? Just remember, it's only impossible until it's done. That was my mantra as well. I'll just had oh, just a round off. Uh, we need to either send everyone email or put all the emails, GP mentors, and follow up from here for people, not just to the next one, so that they know where to follow up from today. Thank you very much. So um, we will send so out. The... hand is up. Oh, okay. She's saying bye bye. I think. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So. Please fill the feedback forms. You know, sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but I think we 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 covered a lot of ground here. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday, and have a good uh, uh, holiday season and and Christmas if you celebrate it. Take care. Thank you very much. Cheers.
You've got this. Go and smash RCA. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you all pass, don't worry. Yeah, thank good you. luck. All the best, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much.